Let me greet everyone who is here and thank you for being part of helping us to improve on these recommendations. My name is Bill Fagey. I'm on the Emeritus faculty at Emory. I'm co-chair. The other co-chair is Dr. Helene Gale, who is the CEO of the Chicago Community Trust. And we are going to call first on the president of the National Academy of Medicine, Dr. Victor Chow. Victor? Uh, thank you very much, Bill and Helene. Uh, I speak on behalf of the National Academies of Sciences, Engineering, Medicine, and welcome all of you to this important public listening session. The Committee on the Equitable Allocation Vaccine for the Novel Coronavirus, which causes the devastating COVID-19 pandemic. So you all know that there's been an intensive effort to accelerate and develop safe and effective vaccines against this novel coronavirus. The whole idea is to protect people from COVID infection and its devastation. This intense effort covers research, discovery, development, clinical trials, manufacturing to maximize production capacity. But under even the best circumstance, experts have said, we may have an effective vaccine by the end of this year, early next year. But we all know that despite these promising efforts, the initial doses will be limited, at least in supply at the very beginning, although there will be enough eventually for everyone. But given this, the scarce vaccine or vaccines will need to be allocated in ways that are thoughtful, strategic, and fair, so we can reduce morbidity, mortality, and or virus transmission to protect people's health and, and its economic and social well-being. So it's important, therefore, that we have a thought, well thought out framework that will help determine who get the vaccine first, who's next, and who's third based on science, public health, social factors, and equity. Because these important decisions affect people's lives and well-being, this framework must be science-based, objective, transparent, trusted, and independent of the government of, of any private interest. I believe this is why NIH and CDC came to us, National Academy of Medicine and the National Academies outside the government to assemble a top team of experts to provide this independent recommendation for a vaccine framework. Just a little bit about us. National Academies was founded in 1863 by Abraham Lincoln and Congress to be an independent advisor to a nation. We're not part of the government. We avoid any financial or other conflicts of interest, especially with for-profit companies. We've always worked in public's interest and over 150 years we've established a reputation of excellence, evidence-based objectivity and trustworthiness. So it is rooted in these principles that we agreed to take on this work and convene an outstanding committee of experts with the highest integrity. I want to take this opportunity to thank the committee co-chairs, Bill Fagey and Aline Gale, and you will hear from both of them, and all the members of the committee who have dedicated their time and expertise to spend the last eight weeks, night and day, long hours to this important task. Now you have all read our preliminary discussion draft. Today's session is important because we want to hear from you the public and get your feedback. During this session, members of public will have an opportunity to address the committee directly. You as individuals or representatives or organizations and provide input on the committee's discussion draft. We wanna hear from you because your opinions matter. We're here to serve the public by giving our best recommendation, but these recommendations have to be practical, acceptable, trusted, and implementable. This is why we look forward to hearing your comments during today's public session, input from public on this draft framework, especially from communities disproportionately affected by COVID-19 is essential to produce a final report that's objective, balanced, and inclusive. So with that introduction, I wanna thank all of you for being here and thank the committee and staff for doing a great job. I'm gonna turn it back to Dr. Fagey who is uh, opening this meeting. Thank you. 
Thank you, Victor, for that important background. And I would add my thanks to CDC and NIH for recognizing that it would be valuable to the public to have a non-government organization make these recommendations. And this is a draft. I want to say that over and over. This is a draft, and that's why we're meeting today, because we want the final product to be even better uh, than this. And I have to add that it's a fast draft. I mean, a really fast draft. Why so fast? Because the health officials at state, county, uh, city, uh, tribal levels need time to prepare the program before the vaccine becomes available. So we had to do this in the fastest possible uh, way. <clears throat> Less than half of this final report is now in your hands. So you can see it's going to be a big report by the time it actually comes out. The uh, uncertainties that we had are overwhelming. I'm not gonna go through all of them, but we don't know when the vaccine will be available. We have no idea how good it will be at different age groups. What will this do for 80 year olds? What will it do for three year olds? We don't know enough about the epidemiology. We've only been studying this disease for six months. And you think of all of the other uh, infectious diseases where we have a vaccine that were studied for years before the vaccine became available. So there's still much to know. The uncertainties were great. So we did the best we could with all of these uncertainties. On the previous committees that I've been on that are similar to this, we always started with the science. And then we've asked the question of how do we look at the ethics of this? This committee did it backwards. And I wanna emphasize that we started with the ethics and we started with equity before we went to the science. And you can ask, why would we do that? And the reason is this pandemic laid bare the problems of equity in this society, the fault lines. It showed us what systemic racism can do to people, the vulnerabilities. And we came to the conclusion that while many people would immediately take the approach, minorities should be first in line, we took the approach, this virus doesn't understand skin color at all, but it understands vulnerabilities. And so we looked at the vulnerabilities and there are many comorbidities, but some of the biggest ones turn out to be uh, heart failure, kidney failure, a uh, body mass index of over 40. Some of the social vulnerabilities have to do with crowding, with people who have to go to work, they don't have an option, with uh, multi-generational uh, occupancy. And so we looked at those things and we put those at first in line, rather than saying skin color is the way we'll make this decision. We tried to talk through every situation. And I tell you that some of these, we don't have enough information. For instance, we want our children to get back to school. Everyone understands how important that is. That means we have to give a priority to teachers and staff in schools, but what about the children? We know from schools opening that there is spread of this virus in school and the children take it home to people that we don't know whether they're vulnerable or not. None of the phase three vaccine studies in this country actually include children under the age of 18. So it's very difficult for us to make a recommendation. We will have to rely on the ACIP to decide what to do with children under 18. Which leads me to, does this committee actually overlap with ACIP? Well, ACIP is a government committee advising CDC. And CDC and NIH said, we also wanna look from non-government uh, people. And so we are hoping the recommendations we give will actually help inform ACIP, but inform the rest of government. I must tell you that this was an incredible committee, a score of people who have never worked together before. And even now, we've never been in the same room together. And yet in a month, it's beyond imagination, we were able to come to an agreement on most of these issues. So it's been a great committee, but 
I also have to thank the Academy for putting together such an unbelievable staff. Uh, people like Lisa Brown and, and uh, Ben Kahn have literally worked day and night and weekends in order to put down the thoughts of this committee, get replies from other people on the committee to take us to where we are today. And where we are today, Dr. Helene Gale is going to tell us what were the highlights of the report particularly for those of you who could not get through it in 24 hours, uh, because there's a lot of material there. So I turn this over now to Dr. Helene Gale. Helene? Thank you, Victor and, and um, Bill. And I will just add a few very, very brief comments because um, our, we've got a lot to cram into five hours. And you know, really, the key part of this is to hear from the public and, and to hear comments. But, you know, just to add my own sense of, you know, the incredibly important task that we were asked to um, commit to. And, you know, I have had the honor and privilege of being part of National Academy studies in the past and other important uh, public service uh, um, opportunities. But I think in some ways, this is one of the most important endeavors that I've been a, a part of in my public uh, health career and, and, and career. You know, this is an unprecedented situation. We have a uh, public health challenge that has had uh, deep economic and political ramifications at a time where we're dealing with all of the uncertainties that um, Bill mentioned in his comments. And so I think this task, which is an incredibly important one, was one that this committee took on uh, very, very seriously, and as people have talked about, worked um, tirelessly to pull together the different backgrounds that are represented in this committee um, to really put together what, what hopefully is a very thoughtful uh, report. But it's why, you know, in some ways, this public hearing uh, and this chance to hear and l listen to comments from the public is perhaps um, as important as ever. You know, we want to make sure that in um, taking together all of the incredible issues that we deliberated around, that we haven't missed perspectives, that, that we're hearing from parts of the public um, that may present different perspectives than we might have had within our own group. And so it's incredibly important for you to um, present and, and provide to us perspectives that you bring from the different um, uh, walks of life and avenues that you that you represent, you know we do want to make sure that you are uh, providing comments on the parts of the draft that we have provided. And as uh, uh, people have mentioned, you know this is half of the report, and we have um, other parts of the report on implementation, on vaccine hesitancy, on on um, communication and community engagement, as well as global aspects. And, and so those parts are coming, but what we really want is to get your best thinking about the draft report that uh, we have provided. So, you know, again, I just want to thank our committee, um, the staff of the National Academies, and to all of you who have taken your time to uh, provide your wisdom, your insights, and your perspectives. So this report can really serve the purpose that we hope it will have of being able to provide uh, independent, unbiased, uh, ethical, and science-based um, frameworks on equitable allocation of COVID vaccine. So with that, I think I will start with a brief overview of the report. And as everybody has said, this is, you know, this is a lot. We haven't provided a, um, a long time for this, but we wanted to make sure that we um, had the opportunity for all of us to be starting from the same um, starting point as we listen to your uh, comments. So I know somebody is advancing slides. And as was mentioned, uh, as was mentioned, um, our two sponsors for the study, the Centers for Disease Control and the National Institutes of Health. And I think it really reflects the kind of collaboration that is so important at a time like this to have the two uh, agencies come together to uh, request that this study be done. Um, the next slide shows the committee um, members, and while we don't have time to go around and introduce you to all of them, we have 18 outstanding committee members that represent epidemiology, 
and modeling demography, public health pra uh, practitioners at the territorial, state, and local, and national levels, ethicists, vaccine researchers, uh, law, economics, and a, and a uh, diversity, uh, racial and ethnic diversity that we think represents um, the populations most impacted. The charge to the committee um, it, it was you know, twofold. First of all, to develop an overarching framework for va vaccine allocation to assist policymakers in the domestic and global communities in planning for equitable allocation of a COVID-19 vaccine. The expectation is that this framework would inform decisions by health authorities, including the ACIP, as Bill mentioned, um, and that they, as they create and implement national and local guidelines for the SARS-CoV-2 vaccine allocation. So that was our overarching charge. Um, that charge had multiple dimensions, and I won't go into these in great detail, but first of all, um, and most importantly, what would be the criteria that should be used in setting priorities for allocation, equitable allocation of a vaccine? How should those uh, criteria be applied um, to determine who should get those first? And then subsequently, um, what were the priority lists for recipients? How will this framework be applied in various scenarios um, given the dis different characteristics and uh, differing availability of doses and, and other scenarios that we'll talk about more. Um, if multiple candidates are available, how will we ensure equity? How can countries assure equity and allocation of COVID-19 vaccine? For the United States specifically, how can communities of color be assured access to vaccination? How do we communicate to the American public and what steps should be taken to mitigate vaccine hesitancy, especially among high priority populations. So that was our overall uh, charge and the different components. As I mentioned, uh, what we will not be covering today and what was not in the draft report are sections on program implementation, uh, vaccine hesitancy, risk communication, and global considerations. And the overview of the discussion draft that we will be discussing are the lessons learned from other allocations, next slide. Lessons learned from other allocation efforts, the framework for the equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine, and then applying the framework for, um, for allocation under uh, various scenarios. Next slide. Now in doing this, we first of all, um, started with some of the lessons learned from other efforts that we thought were relevant to our charge and our task. Um, 2009 H1N1 influenza, the um, Ebola epidemic in West Africa, looking at allocation of scarce medical resources um, during COVID-19, particularly treatment and other uh, medical resources, and then other vaccine allocation frameworks that were in progress. So those were what we took into consideration as we thought about what were some of the lessons that could be learned um, and ap applied to our uh, task. Again, I, don't, I, I won't go into this in a lot of detail. It is in the report, um, but I think suffice it to say, we looked at issues of in, ensuring maximal benefit, uh, promoting common good, saving the greatest number of lives possible, uh, using available evidence to make sure that we're benefiting communities and, and addressing uncertainty, looking at how uh, at frameworks for allocating scarce resources, providing clear and transparent criteria, and then ensuring that this alloc the allocation uh, policies were flexible and responsive to concerns of populations um, and the um, changing epidemiologic situation and vaccine supply, all of which are things, as, as Bill alluded to in his comments, are in, in flux and will change over the course of time. Next slide. Um, and this is our, our overall framework that we um, developed for the equitable all allocation of um, the COVID vaccine. And as, as Bill mentioned, we started with foundational principles. And these foundational principles that are both ethical as well as other principles are kind of 
um, throughout the process of what we're thinking about in terms of the allocation framework. So we wanted to have these foundation, all of what we did grounded in these foundational principles and really very much um, influencing how we thought about our overarching goal, our allocation criteria and our allocation phases. Next slide. Uh, and so these were the foundational principles that we developed. And again, um, taking from established ethical frameworks that already exist and using the ones that we thought were most relevant to the situation and most relevant to our charge. And they are maxima maximization of benefits, um, the obligation to protect and promote the public's health and its social economic well-being in the short and the long run. Um, equal regard, we thought it was important uh, that we looked at requiring that everybody be considered and treated as having equal dignity, worth, and value. Uh, as, as was already mentioned, the mitigation of health inequities is, was an important one for us, a moral imperative for an equitable vaccine allocation system, particularly given the inequities that um, were uh, highlighted throughout this uh, pandemic. Fairness, the obligation to develop allocation criteria based only on relevant non-discriminatory characteristics and to, plot, to apply these criteria impartially to make sure that we are fair in, in procedures in allocation. Evidence base, um, who receives the vaccine should be based on the best available evidence and transparency, the obligation to communicate with the public openly clearly, accurately, and straightforwardly about the vaccine allocation framework and criteria. So those were the overarching um, foundational principles that led to uh, developing our primary goal on the next slide, which is to maximize societal benefit by reducing morbidity and mortality caused by the transmission of the novel coronavirus. And in doing this, we took into consideration the importance of uh, the morbidity and mortality that um, um, ha we have seen as a result of the transmission, but recognizing the importance of also a focus on the transmission of the virus itself. We developed uh, the following uh, risk-based allocation criteria, the first being the risk of acquiring inf infection, uh, the Second, the risk of severe morbidity and mortality, the risk of negative societal impact, and the risk of transmission, uh, transmitting disease to others. We also uh, included in our allocation framework the consideration of mitigating facts uh, as well, because we know that there are ways in which people can mitigate uh, both morbidity and mortality as well as uh, the transmission of disease, and we wanted to take that into consideration as well. So that led to our allocation phases, um, phase one, two, three, and four, uh, based on um, the risk category as mentioned before, as well as our principles. And the phase one is divided into um, a jumpstart phase and a phase 1B. In that first phase, we considered all of the um, groups that we listed as being high priority. But we also realized that at the very beginning of the, of the distribution of the vaccine, we may have a very scarce supply of vaccine available. And so we wanted a group that we thought would be the best group to kind of jumpstart um, the, the distribution of vaccine. And so that group includes high risk workers in healthcare facilities and first responders with the understanding that not only are they highly um, at risk for transmission, but that they also are so important for taking care of others who um, acquire the COVID-19. And so we put them in our first phase. The next part of phase one are people of all ages with the highest risk of uh, comorbidities and then older people living in congregate and overcrowded settings. The phase two um, was critical health, uh, critical workers um, and using DHS category for workers who are in industries that are important for the functioning of society, teachers and, and school staff, 
people of all age with comorbidity and underlying conditions that put them at moderately higher risk, all older adults that are not included in phase one, people in homeless shelters, um, and, and similar environments and people in prisons, jails, detention centers. Um, phase three includes young adults, children, and workers in, in industry um, that, were, that are considered essential to the functioning, but not in phase two. And then phase four, as we said, we hope that as the vaccine becomes available, and the number of, of vaccine courses are available that anyone in the United States that did not receive the vaccine in previous phases would be included in that in the fourth phase. Important for us across all of the phases is our equity considerate cross cutting consideration. So within each of these groups, each population group vaccine access will be prioritized by geographic areas identified through CDC's social vulnerability index with the idea again of looking at what are some of the underlying causes that put populations at greatest risk, particularly communities of color and low so social economic status populations. Uh, ensuring equity um, within the population groups, as I mentioned, we uh, looked at the social vulnerability um, index, CDC social vulnerability index, and we'll prioritize within the four phases based on that uh, social vulnerability index. Finally, uh, we applied the framework in various scenarios. And in this box, it looks at some of the uncertainty factors that would affect vaccine allocation. And what we tried to do at a high level was to look at our framework and how it might adapt in various vaccine scenarios. And so we'll um, be happy to take comments on this as well, but what we tried to do was to look at given number and timing of doses, number of available vaccine, uh, vaccine efficacy and safety differences, vaccine uptake, epidemiologic conditions, vaccine distribution and administration, and political and regulatory environment, and how they might impact uh, our uh, vaccine allocation framework. Uh, so that is, that is described in uh, the third chapter that you have available. So I think with that, uh, I hope that this was a good opportunity to, um, in brief, hear where we landed landed in terms of our allocation framework. And now uh, would like to turn it over to uh, public comment with our confirmed speakers. So I will turn it over um, uh, first. Uh, before turning it over, let me just uh, go over our, our rules of conduct. Uh, many of you have been in some of these public meetings before, so you're very aware of this. Um, we are asking that commenters maintain the same rules of public decorum that they would in a traditional public meeting. Please maintain the order and don't display behavior that is disruptive. The National Academy reserved the right to mute or disconnect virtual participants if they are disruptive. Um, commenters may not present comments or questions to the committee unless recognized by the chair or the staff. And I think the staff will be calling on most of our presenters. And uh, with that, I think we will open it up for public comment. Thank you, Helene. Uh, yeah, so we're gonna get started. And first on our list, we have Randall Morgan from the W. Montague Cobb NMA Health Institute. Your time begins now. Good afternoon and thank you for the opportunity to provide comments today. I am Randall C. Morgan, Jr., MD, and I'm the executive director of the W. Montague Cobb NMA Health Institute and the 95th president of the National Medical Association. I will speak today on behalf of the W. Montague Cobb NMA Health Institute and the NMA. My comments will be about the ethical considerations of vaccine allocation and about an informed strategy to assure that the social determinants of health that negatively affect black and brown people during the COVID-19 pandemic will be mitigated by focused community planning strategies that begin now, well before vaccine availability. The Cobb Institute was founded in 2004 by the National Medical Association to be a research-based organization 
with a mission to eliminate health disparities and to achieve health equity through research, inquiry, and advocacy. From the years 2010 to 2013, the Carver Institute was funded by the Office of Minority Health to study and recommend strategies to increase the level of immunizations of African-American and Hispanic seniors for seasonal influenza in order to avoid epidemics. Much was learned about involving the primary medical providers in the community to increase immunization rates among their patients by personal intervention and influence among skeptical and reluctant senior patients. This model was successful as the national rates for immunization increased each year of the intervention. The influence of the trusted provider, nurse, or community worker was essential then and even more essential now as we prepare for COVID-19 vaccine. I will focus my comments today on the key statements of the discussion draft found on page 37 under the topic mitigation of health inequities. The obligation to mitigate health inequities and their effects has become particularly salient in this pandemic. COVID-19 infections and deaths are strongly associated with race, ethnicity, occupation, and socioeconomic status. A significantly higher burden is experienced by Black, Hispanic, Latinx, American Indian, and Alaska Native populations. It is the opinion of the Cobb Institute and its partner, the National Medical Association, that any strategy to decrease the mortality rates due to coronavirus virus must account for the greater percentage of black and brown deaths per capita. This overrepresentation is problematic at all of the national hotspots demonstrated by proven cases. The causes of multifactorial, however, the lack of availability or acceptance of the vaccine will simply compound this situation. Transparency must address reality when looking at the course of the disease and of the virulence of the virus. We identify for further discussion and consideration challenges related to many of the patients that we serve. First, there are ethical challenges. First, the suspicion of vaccines in the black community historically. Second, the lack of trusted providers and information sources during the process. Second, there are vaccine preparation and dissemination challenges. The lack of preparation and participation by black and brown people in the current clinical trials for all of the vaccines. The reality that the recommendations for maximum vaccine effectiveness means that two doses of the vaccine will likely be required. The lack of true education programs to include vaccine and vaccination literally, literacy for those community residents who have major trust issues. And finally, a different view of equity and fairness that emphasizes prevention of unnecessary deaths in high risk populations. Thank you for the invitation today, and we look forward to contributing to the solutions to these challenges. Thank you very much, Dr. Morgan, and thank you also as the first speaker setting a um, uh, being a role model for five minutes really means five minutes. So thank you very much for that. And uh, I, I trust that uh, everyone else will follow that model. Thank you very much. Uh, next up, we have Elizabeth Ophelia from the Association of Black Cardiologists. Good afternoon, Dr. Spiggy Gill and Dr. Zhao and the committee. And uh, thank you for this opportunity. My name is Elizabeth Ophelia. I am a cardiologist, professor of medicine at Morehouse School of Medicine, and I practice cardiology with Morehouse Healthcare. I am here today representing the Association of Black Cardiologists, where I serve as a chair of the board. I'm particularly interested and in appreciate uh, the committee's focus and transparency on sharing, obviously, some of the methodologies to ensure equity. As a professional medical society with an established community voice, such as the ABC, with more than 2,000 members and uh, two-thirds of who are community health advocates, we have a unique role of bridging not just the point-of-care service that our members provide, 
vaccine hesitancy. As stated in the report, lines 834 to 836, ultimately, the mitigation of health inequities includes development and deployment of distribution systems that ensure that people who are allocated a vaccine actually receive it, i.e. by taking it where they are, can afford it even if they are hard to reach. In this regard, the Association of Black Cardiologists members and physicians like that who serve these communities are a significant asset. But we ask that the recommendations clearly acknowledge the fact that the cost of a vaccine goes beyond the vaccine itself, includes practice infrastructure to administer the vaccine, and in order to overcome some of the vaccine hesitancy, there's a significant amount of time and effort required, and that needs to be included as part of the distribution process. Mitigation of health inequities as documented in lines 1054 to 1062 um, really mention the fact that there are aspects of race ethnicity that's included in the prioritization, but it falls short of actually stating race ethnicity. The ABC strongly recommends that mitigating health inequities should specifically prioritize ethnic minorities who are most severely impacted by COVID-19. The ABC and others have documented that African Americans have poorer outcomes of care, regardless of socioeconomic status. And so the vulnerability indices may not capture this type of inequity. We know that another challenge is severe underrepresentation of African Americans in current vaccine trials. We certainly welcome the opportunity to provide real world data collection and pharmacovigilance through a collaborative and carefully evaluated COVID-19 vaccine and therapeutics registry. We will be putting in these written comments and we thank you for the opportunity to join this discussion. Thank you very much uh, for your comments, uh, Dr. Ophelia. And also, uh, you know, I think some of the comments that you made really bring to, will be brought to bear in some of the chapters that we have not released um, yet on hesitancy, implementation, et cetera. So thank you. Um, that will help those deliberations as well. Thank you. Next up, we have Ellen Provost from the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium Epicenter. Uh, thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Dr. Ellen Provost. I am a physician board certified in preventive medicine and general public health. I serve as the director for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium's Alaska Native Epidemiology Center, one of 12 tribal epi centers serving Indian country. The Tribal Health Consortium serves at the core of the Alaska Tribal Health System. This system is a hub and spoke network for the delivery of clinical and public health services for the 229 federally recognized tribes in Alaska with over 180,000 members. I speak before you today to share that Alaska Native people must be identified as a population at high risk of severe illness and death from SARS-CoV-2 when considering the allocation and distribution of COVID-19 vaccine. Alaska Native people are explicitly named as a high risk group for the influenza vaccine, and this designation should be the case for the COVID-19 vaccine as well. The Great Death. This is how the pandemic flu of 1918 is remembered by Alaska Native people. Half the deaths that year were due to influenza and 80% of those were among Alaska Native people. Villages were decimated. It is this collective memory that is alive and well today, making people fearful that this could happen again. Although great strides have been made in improving Alaska Native health, some of these risk factors that existed back then still exist. Risk factors such as geographic isolation and the socioeconomic and health disparities that we are all well aware of. About half of our population live off the road system presenting significant challenges for access to uh, needed health services. Poverty is three times higher for Alaska Native people and unemployment two times higher. And deaths from influenza and pneumonia have consistently been three times higher for Alaska Native people in more recent times. An estimated 40% of Alaska Native people currently meet the CDC criteria for having underlying medical conditions that put them at risk for severe illness from COVID-19. 
Clearly, Alaska Native people are at high risk and early widespread distribution of a safe and effective vaccine would greatly mitigate the risk of another great death. What did we learn from the H1N1 pandemic? We learned that indigenous populations suffer disproportionately. They experienced higher rates of hospitalizations, ICU admissions, and a fourfold increase of influenza-related deaths. In the 2016 study by Hennessy et al., the authors distinguished between a risk factor-based strategy and designating a population as high risk. Following 2009, American Indians and Alaska Natives were prioritized to receive vaccine on the basis of racial status. Thus, we learned and should continue to maintain the high-risk designation for American Indian and Alaska Native people in lieu of a risk factor-based strategy. What do we currently know about COVID-19? Hatcher et al. in the August 19th MMWR stated that the cumulative incidence among American Indian and Alaska Native persons was three and a half times greater than non-Hispanic whites. In addition, preliminary results from a yet unpublished study coordinated by CSTE and tribal epicenters showed a mortality rate that is 2.6 times higher than non-Hispanic whites. This suggests that the Alaska Native American Indian population has been disproportionately affected by the SARS-CoV-2 pandemic. If we are to avoid another great death, if we are to avoid compounding inequities and increasing disparities, if we are to protect our Alaska Native people and our health systems throughout the state of Alaska and reduce the current and future potential impact of this pandemic, this committee will acknowledge Alaska Native people are at significant risk of hospitalization and death from SARS-CoV-2 and explicitly place this population in the highest priority group for COVID-19 vaccine allocation and distribution. Thank you again to the committee for this opportunity to provide input and I hope there will be future opportunities in this process as well. Thank you. Thank you very much. Very appreciate your comments very much. Thank you. Um, Great. Next up we have Elena Rios from the National Hispanic Medical Association. Uh, thank you. I'm Dr. Elena Rios with the uh, President and CEO of the National Hispanic Medical Association. Uh, thank you for the opportunity. Uh, I think that uh, we, the National Hispanic Medical Association was created to provide uh, input and to serve as a resource on policies and programs that impact the Hispanic and other underserved communities. And I have to say, first of all, that you know, I, we agree with the, uh, the, the report, the, so far, the, uh, the criteria for allocation, the goal, and the, the phases. Uh, I think what I'd like to say really uh, is about the fact that Hispanics are very heterogeneous in this country. Even though one out of four Americans will be of Hispanic origin, there's quite a big difference. I'm Mexican-American from the Southwest, from Los Angeles area. And, uh, you know, uh, we didn't have uh, Latin Americans until the revolutions in the 1980s. And I think that the, and, and on, the, on the Eastern seaboard, you've got the Puerto Rican and the Cuban uh, in the Dominican communities. And I think that there's, there's also a, a huge difference in uh, family structure uh, in terms of mixed families. Uh, so the Eastern coast uh, are citizens uh, in terms of Puerto Ricans, Cubans, uh, and on the West coast, you've got many, many Mexican uh, immigrants. My grandparents were, uh, did get documented, what were brought over in the Bracero programs and the programs of the 1920s and 30s. I think that that's something that is not uh, talked about in the, in the report. The fact that the allocation criteria is about individuals and not families. I think families need are very big in terms of the uh, educational efforts, uh, in the trust efforts, and in um, I think what needs to happen is to have stories about our families, uh, stories about the survivors of COVID stories about how to that the vaccine works um, and, and and many of that many of this uh, attitude I think comes from our our, our health care uh, in our communities and traditional health has been passed on from our grandmothers to our mothers my mother was a nurse um, I, I think I I got that healing spirit and I and I do believe that we have a lot more um, 
educational uh, information than is noted uh, because we do have health literacy problems and low income problems and low education problems. However, there's a very basic fundamental interest in having our children be healthy and being able to go to work and, able, and being able to get ahead and go to school. And for the Hispanic population, I think that there's something uh, that is missing in terms of that understanding. And I know that um, Dr. Gale, you mentioned the, that the rest of the report will deal with communications and education. But I just think that when we talk about criteria that there is something missing here. And I'm, we have uh, developed uh, uh, programs with the Office of Minority Health along with NMA and AAIP and, and others uh, about influenza, seasonal influenza, working with our providers. Uh, NHMA represents uh, 50,000 Hispanic physicians right now that are licensed in this country. We have 17 chapters. Uh, and we have uh, uh, categories of membership that include young physicians, uh, residents, and medical students. And I think they all are very unique uh, because we're only 5% of the population of physicians in the country. And I think that the providers uh, through our organizations that are nonprofit, we're not con necessarily connected to one medical school or uh, you know, there is no real, on the mainland, uh, Hispanic medical schools there are Hispanic serving medical schools, but I think our providers have a lot of expertise and a lot of experience that needs to be uh, uh, brought to the, to the forefront in, uh, with the uh, National Academy here. And I think the only other thing I'd say is that we're very concerned about uh, trust issues, and I know that it is important to have trusted voices. Uh, we have many, many physicians and providers, community health workers, um, caregivers in our homes that need to be part of the of the uh, allocation system uh, and also cost issues. Uh, in many of the Latino uh, community, uh, like the other ethnic racial groups, are part of the uh, essential workers, can't work at home, and uh, are working in nursing homes, working in hospitals, working in the uh, retail industry, supermarkets, food industry, farm workers, and many, many, uh, many high risk uh, populations within, within, our, within our group. So I thank just you. think that it's very yeah, important thank, to do this. Thank you. Thank you very much. Sorry. To, uh, we're really, That's okay. yeah, yeah. But uh, great points as always. Thank you very much. Um, and I think we'll move on now to our next speaker, um, Jim Roberts. Oh, ben, you're supposed to introduce. Go ahead. <laughs> All good. Jim Roberts, take it away from the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. Yeah, thank you for having me today. So my name is Jim Roberts. I work as a senior executive liaison in the Intergovernmental Affairs Department for the Alaska Native Tribal Health Consortium. ANTHC is a statewide tribal health organization that serves over 229 tribes and provides services to more than 189,000 uh, Alaska Natives. We operate a tertiary care hospital in Anchorage and we also provide a wide range of statewide public health, community health, environmental health, and other programs and services throughout the state of Alaska. My colleague, Dr. Provis, uh, just discussed uh, some of the epidemiology issues related to, to the framework. So I'm gonna focus my comments on allocation issues that are discussed throughout the, throughout the framework. Um, so th th my first recommendation has to do with, you know, Alaska Native and health disparities and, and, and the mitigation of health inequities uh, and, and how this must inform allocation of COVID-19 vaccine. And I think uh, what's important to underscore about this is that Ellen uh, discussed some of the effects of, of health disparities in the Spanish flu pandemic in Alaska, which was extremely severe. Mortality rates were four times higher than, than were reported for larger cities in the United States. The virus exacted a worldwide death toll of about 50 million, but more people died on a per capita basis in Alaska than anywhere, well, in Alaska than anywhere on earth with the exception of Samoa. Among Alaskans, the vast majority of deaths were among Alaska Native people. The Spanish pandemic devastated our state and rural Alaska. Whole villages were depopulated and broken and have never recovered to this day. Without a vaccine plan that acknowledges the unique needs of Alaska and our tribal communities, we fear a similar result from COVID-19. 
Such a tragedy is preventable and we must not forget the lesson of rural Alaska um, vulnerability to the, to the influ influenza pandemic. We support the framework's foundational principle and recommendation related to mitigation of health inequities. And the statement I found pr particularly found compelling was that health inequities are a moral imperative on an equitable vaccine allocation system. The framework goes on to discuss the importance of respecting tribal sovereignty and tribal governments. We thank you for the inclusion of these statements and placing a high priority on mitigating the impact of health inequities. We agree with the underlying principle about mitigation of health inequities in the framework. It justifies specific vaccine distribution and recommendations to address vulnerable populations and communities affected by these disparities. This includes tribal communities. But it's important that the framework also explain that allocation decisions related to tribes is in fulfillment of the unique legal and trust relationship that the United States has with tribal governments. This is supported in the Commerce Clause in the of the Constitution and numerous case law. Uh, so we think that's an important element to also include and underscore throughout the framework, certainly as this policy document will inform other, other uses, uh, we feel that it's very important to include that element in, in, in the discussion. Thirdly, tribal governments and tribal uh, health organizations should be discussed as essential partners in the framework's COVID allocation of COVID-19 vaccine. So we acknowledge and thank the committee for the, the, the inclusion of references to the uh, tribal government's trust responsibility and that it should allocate vaccine to tribal, urban, and, Indian health, and the Indian Health Service facilities directly through the existing IHS system. However, we further recommend that the report expand the discussion about the distribution process to allocate vaccine directly to tribes and tribal health organizations, as well as urban Indian health organizations, and not just through the Indian Health Service. We make this recommendation uh, in acknowledgement that 50% of the IHS programs are contracted or compacted under, directly by tribal organizations and tribes under the Indian Self-Determination Act. While IHS is a partner in the distribution process, it is much more effective and timely and efficient to directly work with tribes and tribal health organizations that contract and compact these programs from IHS. A good example of why we make this recommendation is some of the experiences that we're, we're dealing with right now related to testing supplies. We are having extreme dis difficulty uh, filling orders for, for testing supplies that are channeled through the, through the federal government and through the state's allocation methodology. We also had similar experiences related to H1 vaccine uh, distribution, uh, where we were challenged with that process as well. And the process would have been much more efficient had that flowed through the tribal health system and, and, and with those tribal programs that contract and compact programs directly from, from the federal government. Um, Item four relates to vaccine distribution administration that's discussed on page 94. This section of the framework discusses how the federal government will issue guidelines for allocation distribution and administration of the vaccine. The framework discusses an example of how a state may Jim, make a- Jim, I'm sorry to cut you off, but your five minutes have gone off. Okay, so, but, but basically we recommend that the framework include and discuss requirements for tribal consultation and the framework's allocation criteria for vaccine distribution. We think these will also kind of complement the existing recommendations that are already included. So I thank I you think very much. Yeah, thank you very much for your comments. And please, we look forward to if you want to submit um, any further in, in written comments. I think we have our last presenter for this panel. Yes, next up we have Winston Wong with the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians. Uh, I wish to thank the committee for not only inviting um, myself on behalf of the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians to offer some recommendations, but also the terrific job that you've been doing in terms of this very Herculean task. Uh, again, my name is Winston Wong. I'm a practicing family physician and also the chairperson of the National Council of Asian Pacific Islander Physicians, also known as NCAPIT. I'm also honored to chair the Roundtable on Health Equity at the National Academy of Medicine, but my comments today are really on behalf of NCAPIT, as, as we are known. We're an organization of organizations in terms of our composition. We've been in existence for 10 years, and we represent physicians that are organized in IPAs, academic centers, community health centers, and large healthcare delivery systems. But we're all, all united around addressing health inequity in the API Native Hawaiian community. The API Native Hawaiian community has been hit hard by the COVID-19 
pandemic in multiple ways. The committee uh, cites the disproportionate burden of disease on various minority communities, including Black, Native American, and Latinx communities, but failed to mention the equally alarming and distressing rates of infection and death in API Native Hawaiian communities. The Pacific Islander community in particular has experienced mortality rates up to five times the proportion to the, to the general population. Marshallese, uh, Chukis are seeing rates of COVID-19 as high or higher than any other racial ethnic group in states such as Arkansas and Oklahoma, where they uh, fulfill a significant part of the agricultural industry. Native Hawaiians suffer from COVID-19 mortality at a rate three times higher than their proportion of the population in the state of Hawaii. Half of the deaths in the county of San Francisco were among Asians and Pacific Islanders, and the patterns of Pacific Islander mortality are also uh, true in the state of California. This report addresses the mitigation of health inequities, but it's a disappointing omission to not explicitly cite the APIH NH disparities in the pandemic. The report goes on to cite specific aspects of health inequities. Uh, namely social disadvantage, at risk of social exposure because of the nature of essential work and living in dense settings. All of these factors are a feature of API Native Hawaiian communities. While much of our communities has often been, be, been depicted as occupying high-tech industries, we are in fact disproportionately represented in service sector jobs in hotels, in the hospitality industry, in family business, and most tellingly, we occupy many important roles in low-paying healthcare occupations such as nursing aides and long-term care facilities. The INCAPIT wishes to emphasize that vaccine allocation needs to incorporate three strategies that we think are really essential and relevant to um, its implementation immediately. We need to, number one, aside from utilizing social vulnerability indexes, we need to identify populations most at risk, taking into account the realities of multi-family households that rely on a few breadwinners that heighten risk and infection. These indicators are only known by community grounded organizations that serve our communities and by physicians who are embedded in the community providing care to ethnic enclaves and linguistically isolated communities. Number two, there's a political vulnerability that needs to be acknowledged. Both references to the China virus and policies that are being promoted to change the definition of public charge that impacts immigrants, stoke fear and avoidance of screening for COVID-19 and in all probability vaccination. We have to acknowledge these are really political threats to how patients and communities foresee how they access themselves to vaccinations. Number three, it is not enough for public health departments to identify tiers of risk and phases of vaccine allocation if cultural and linguistic barriers are not addressed, i.e. we have to look at cultural competence. Two thirds of Asian, Asian American Pacific Islanders are foreign born and one third, seven million are of limited English proficiency. So cultural competence strategies must be incorporated into the allocation of vaccines. The API community is a vital part of American society. Their increased risk for infection and death are being reviewed in this pandemic. Please consider their unique circumstances and the risk of marginalization and allocation of vaccines that need to be acknowledged and incorporated into the recommendations. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and um, very helpful comments. Um, I think we are now going to, and, and thank the entire panel that focused on um, issues specifically related to uh, communities of color and communities that are disproportionately impacted. We will now transition to our second panel on state and local government and, and health care. Um, so I will turn it over to Ben to get us started. Great, thank you. Next, we have Aaron Payment from the Sioux St. Marie tribe of Chippewa Indians. Mm -hmm. 
Dan, he's not on the panelist list. I don't think he's here. That's okay. I'm going to give, uh, so we'll come back to Aaron Payment. Aaron Payment, if you come on, if you are on, uh, you will have one more chance at the end of this panel to provide remarks. So in that case, we will move on to Oscar Allen from the National Association of County and City Health Officials. Eileen? Allen, that's fine. Oh, okay. <laughs> there are two ways. Allen is the way. Okay. All right. <laughs> so thank you again. Uh, my name is Dr. Oscar Allen. I'm representing NACHO, the National Association of County and City Health Officials, which is comprised of the nearly 3,000 health departments across the U.S., serving as a leader and catalyst and voice of local health departments. Uh, specifically, when you think about the role of health departments with respect to immunization, uh, we know that most of the common clinical programs uh, that reside in services in LHDs remain with respect to immunizations for, for about 88% uh, providing both childhood and adult immunization. And that is consistent regardless of the size, urbanization, or rurality. Uh, we know that the health departments have been chief health strategists or community health strategists in that regard and working very closely with key uh, community stakeholders, whether it's healthcare schools, daycares, nursing homes, faith based institutions, and other colleagues, is what uh, have been represented here today. Uh, our common activities with respect to hosting immunization clinics, conducting education and outreach, and providing Im immunization across the life plan. Uh, as well as uh, being knee deep in the conducting of communication campaigns. Uh, so when we think about the impact of COVID on LHDs, and I'll get to the draft in two seconds, the nearly 90% of our members that we, uh, we did an assessment on with respect to the impact on the LHD immunization programs have talked about how frequently immunization activities have been altered. And that's been provision of clinical services, education outreach, routine uh, VFC, school audits, uh, and you name it, there's been a tremendous impact. And not only that, but also with respect to the overall loss in our workforce capacity and infrastructure over this, over this period point of time. And as was mentioned, we support the incorporation and adoption of principles of social justice in everyday public health practice to eliminate the root causes of health inequities that have been essentially rampant in our total communities across the country. Uh, we've actually seen that one health department has established community mitigation groups to work in collaboration with local organizations to participate in what is called accountable communities of health, going in depth with respect to black, indigenous, and other people of colors to ensure that these communications, both from flu and flu vaccines and others, and messages are linguistically, culturally uh, tailored and responsive. So as it pertains to the draft, and we appreciate the opportunity to provide comments, we will focus on a few things. The outline of the vaccine allocation phases and the rationalized prioritization, and an examination of that framework and its application under various scenarios. With respect to the phase approach, we feel that uh, the phase approach does make sense and is guided by what we have learned in H1N1. I will tell you that I am one of those who still experience my PTSD as a local epidemiologist dealing with H1N1. Uh, but that tiered approach did illustrate for us an opportunity to hopefully make better assumptions around the population's ability to social distance and other mitigating factors. Uh, given the current reality of community mitigation with schools and businesses reopening, we ask to reconsider the assumption that a group may be able to social distance uh, and really uh, look specifically at how to clarify and define those high risk comorbidities versus the moderate risk types as shown as a footnote on the table. The effective allocation of the vaccine will be critical to containing this pandemic. So it is important to ensure that prioritization guidance be flexible to accommodate the changing characteristics and epidemiology. As local public health will be on the ground implementing these recommendations of this committee, it is important to ensure that there's continued support for local public health as they operationalize plans to identify, contact, and mobilize targeted vaccine efforts. Vaccine allocation under various scenarios. The number and time in a vaccine uh, has been discussed. Uh, we know that there's limited doses that may be available as early as November. Therefore, there's the need for expedited plans that is critical for state and local territorial uh, and tribal authorities to be able to implement an allocation plan that is equitable. Vaccine efficacy and vaccine safety must be transparent and communicated with administrators and the public to ensure that any shift in allocation is clearly defined and communicated. For example, our colleagues in Denver said one important point that they didn't see that there should be a requirement in this document to have all administrators of this vaccine put their information into an IIS. Uh, and hopefully it's the IIS that has been implemented at that local level. 
A focus of building out that structure will be important for the various types of vaccines, inventory management, and that should also be included in this document. With respect to vaccine uptake consideration and training, these are all important tasks. And we wanna make sure that there's proper training for those healthcare providers to truly impact and be a critical component in increasing vaccine confidence. Um, with respect to community mitigation models during the rollout of COVID, we recognize that that needs to be maintained because it's important to consider what the current reality is with respect to social distancing, utilization of masks and hand hygiene, and the need to continue to communicate this during an important vaccine rollout. So there must be strong consideration of public health messaging, which is needed as a dual approach. And it is not yet, it is not just about making banners or, or bulletin boards. We have to truly embrace what is going to be important to affect to affect communication. So Oscar, I'm sorry to cut you off, but your five minutes are up. I was close. I, I tried. I did my New York minute. Okay. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, and, uh, you know, we hate to have to cut off some of this very rich discussion, but in the interest of fairness for all of our speakers, um, and if there's something that has already been covered, feel free to just say ditto and move on so that we can cover as, as much ground as we possibly can. So thank you very much. Next up, we have David Gerstner from the Dayton Metropolitan Medical Response System. Thank you. My name is David Gerstner. I'm with Dayton Fire Department in Dayton, Ohio, where I'm the regional MMRS coordinator for a 10 county area in West Central Ohio. I'm speaking on behalf of Dayton MMRS and we appreciate the opportunity to speak with this group today. Like other MMRS cities, we've been involved with pandemic pl planning for two decades now. Dayton MMRS had a leading role for EMS response during the H1N1 pandemic in 2009 and 2010. Public safety, which includes firefighting, emergency medical services or EMS, law enforcement, public safety dispatch, and emergency management agencies or EMAs, along with public health are crucial components of US infrastructure. EMS is a component of the healthcare as well as the emergency services sectors. During 2009 and 2010, EMS played significant roles in vaccination campaigns, including assistance with vaccination at public or open points of dispensing, pods, uh, vaccination of homebound and homeless population, and vaccination at closed pods. Planning's already underway to provide similar assistance with both influenza and COVID-19 vaccination campaigns this year. As late as summer 2009, CDC and the Department of Homeland Security were planning collaboratively and included public health and public safety personnel in tier one vaccination allocations. When the ACIP priority groups were, replaced, were released, they included healthcare and emergency medical services personnel, but not other public health and public safety personnel. That resulted in the paradoxical situation where we had certain public health and public safety personnel assisting with vaccination efforts, but who were not permitted to receive the vaccine. There were law enforcement officers, including in my region, who lost their lives from H1N1, including some who were turned away from vaccination clinics. Numerous law enforcement, EMS, and fire personnel have already died this year from COVID-19. We applaud the committee's efforts and are very grateful that healthcare and public health personnel are included in the phase 1A priority. Critical infrastructure issues must be considered when determining vaccination allocation and prioritization. Including dispatch and EMA personnel will have minimal impact on the numbers. And although those personnel may have vulnerabilities that are less than frontline providers, the emergency services sector cannot function without them. We ask and recommend that this categorization continue into the final draft and that it include all public health, firefighting, EMS, law enforcement, public safety dispatch, 
and emergency management personnel. Thank you again for the opportunity to speak to this group and we will submit uh, uh, comments in writing as well, but thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Gerstner. Great, next up we have Sira Madad from the New York City uh, Health and Hospitals. I see the name, but uh, He's muted. Mario, are you can muted? You unmute him? I'm trying she to unmute him. I recognized her name. Her name is pronounced, I guess, as Saira Madad. Um, and so um, maybe that's the reason why. There, there she is. Yeah. Okay. You're muted, I think, Saira. Um, you still you are showing up. Oh, she's connecting. We could perhaps go on to the next speaker and then, oh, you, are you there? Is this better? Is this better? Yep. Okay, all right. I, I called in on my phone, so I guess there was an issue there, but let me go ahead and get started. So uh, thank you for the opportunity to, to speak today. Um, so I'd like to first thank the National Academies of Science, Engineering and Medicine to, you know, for organizing this forum uh, and for the committee uh, for providing the nation a framework for equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine. Uh, I went over the framework and the proposed framework is based on sound ethical values and widely acceptable principles. And importantly, it's based on science, transparency, and societal functioning and is evidence-based core elements that should be driving all public health decisions. And I agree with the overall allocation uh, criteria proposed in the framework. Um, just to provide just two brief suggestions based on uh, what I've read within the framework. First, on the disability community, while um, the priority in the framework framework doesn't exclude the disabled, there should be more context for this particular community, which affects approximately 61 um, million or nearly one in four um, Americans uh, in the United States. Secondly, as we know, risk is not uniform even among frontline healthcare workers. I appreciate vaccine access should not be defined by professional title, but rather by the individual's actual risk of exposure to COVID-19. Having conducted numerous vaccine focus groups among healthcare workers, uh, specifically, uh, specifically for seasonal influenza, a common finding within these focus groups that I tend to find is just the overall hesitancy due to multiple uh, factors among healthcare workers. And so a consideration for this framework as we move forward is one, the ongoing education around um, vaccines and the allocation, two, full transparency on the data, and three, a clear distribution process. So those are just some of my high-level remarks. Um, thank you for having an open session. Thank you very much. Great, thank you. Next, we have Marcus Plessia from the Association of State and Territorial Health Officials. Great, thanks. Can you hear me okay? Okay, I'm Marcus Plush. I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the Association of State and Territory Health Officials. Um, thank you for the opportunity to provide some comments on the discussion draft for the preliminary framework for equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccine. The Association of State and Territory Health Officials is the national organization that represents leadership in state and territorial public health agencies. And as I think most of you know, state and territorial public health agencies will ultimately be playing a central role in the vaccine capacity and allocation process at the state level. <clears throat> ASTO is submitting detailed written comments for your review. And in the interim, I'd like to highlight the following areas. First of all, on behalf of our members, we'd like to thank the National Academy's committee members and staff for their work preparing this framework. The framework is an exceptional resource and guide for our state and local public health efforts. It's well-grounded in scientific evidence space and it draws on the expertise of recognized and trusted national experts. It builds on knowledge of previous max vaccination efforts and is well-grounded in ethical models. It's adaptable to a number of different future scenarios. And most importantly, it takes a close look at what are increasingly concerning inequities in the burden of COVID-19 across our society. ASTO appreciates the attention to address health inequities through equitable allocation throughout this report and we'll have some additional suggestions about this issue in our written comments um, and, and provide you with some further considerations. We'd also like to offer three specific recommendations uh, on uh, potential refinement to the document. 
Uh, first of all, we believe the document should reinforce the role of the American Council on Immunization Practices, ACIP, as the primary decision-making body. The committee framework provides excellent considerations, but its role and authority could be confusing. And so ASTO encourages the committee to further describe with greater transparency how the existing ACIP body will provide the final prioritization guidance. Secondly, we'd like to document, we'd like to suggest that the document should reinforce the need for state-based flexibility to set priorities. While it would be important for the framework to be applied uniformly across the country, it's also critical for each state to have the flexibility to tailor vaccination prioritization to meet local needs. As you know, allocation will depend on various key factors, such as public confidence, a better understanding of risk factors, and safety and, and, safety and efficacy issues of the vaccine in certain populations. <clears throat> so we recommend that allocation decisions continue to be customized and adapted at the state level. And we also recommended that state public health departments be closely involved in any specific strategies or allocations designed to address health disparities. Finally, we'd like to emphasize that both the document and committee uh, place an emphasis on a unified approach and messaging around vaccine distribution and allocation. It will be very important for all government and civic entities engaged in this effort to communicate and engage with the public in a unified, consistent, and transparent manner. Discord among leaders at any level will erode public trust. We suggest that the document provide further clarification of the roles and actions of leaders at different levels of society, and that reinforce that any changes in policy or guidance should be clearly explained and based on consensus among public health leaders who oversee and are responsible for effective implementation. Again, we'll provide additional comments in our written uh, application or our, our written submission. We appreciate the opportunity to uh, make these comments. And again, thank you for your work. Thank you. And thank you for the work of ASTO. Uh, next. Great. Next, we have Christian Ramers from the Family Health Centers of San Diego. Thank you so much. Can you hear me okay? Great. I, I just want to say it's an honor and a privilege to be speaking to you. I did my training at the University of Washington in the William Fagey Building at the uh, Department of Global Health. So uh, I am an infectious disease physician in San Diego. I work at a large federally qualified health center, and I'm really just going to share some of my own thoughts regarding our experience of the pandemic thus far on the front lines. Um, I want to share with you just what it's looked like in San Diego. We've had dramatic racial and ethnic disparities that are just mind-blowing. In San Diego, we have a population that's about 34% Latino or Latinx, and yet 62% of our cases are in the Latinx community. That's a doubling in terms of a disparity amongst cases, and similar disparities exist in, in death rates. We also have a, a dramatic geographic disparity where there's a clear gradient from affluent communities down to poor communities where the COVID case rates are much, much higher by zip code and our local media has been reporting on this. Uh, thirdly, uh, I think it's important that the outbreak in San Diego has shown the importance of local trusted partners such as community health clinics and FQHCs. I'll give you just a couple of examples. We have a large homeless population in San Diego and although the county would love to be the outreach and, and the ones doing education, it's really the local partners um, uh, that have been doing the testing, um, the cohorting, uh, in collaboration with the county, I should say, to help keep, keep us from having a congregate living outbreak. And I think the local partners have actually the best eyes on the, on the local situation on the ground. For example, as a, as a county, our test positivity rate has hovered around 3 to 5% for COVID testing. And yet in my own clinics, where we've conducted almost 30,000 tests, our positivity rate is 10 to 15%. So if you were to just take even what you think is a granular look at the county level and say, well, this is a high risk county, this is a low risk county, you're missing the full picture. Uh, so having local partners and local data to be able to drive where we put this vaccine first, I think is incredibly important. Uh, I'm just gonna summarize a couple of comments from my colleagues that I solicited. I think this has already been said, but we really need to use data to drive our response and to allocate the vaccine appropriately. I've reviewed the plans from the 2009 pandemic, uh, really targeting pregnant women, older individuals, those with contact with infants under age six. This is a very different virus. And so we need to use our data to show us where the highest risk communities are. 
such as those with diabetes, cardiovascular disease, obesity, metabolic syndrome. And we have to acknowledge the racial differences um, in terms of how this virus is affecting people. As I mentioned, we have to take into account local data. We have to acknowledge the racial and socioeconomic disparities that this pandemic has revealed. And I think we need to take a close look at what we consider to be an essential worker. If we're asking undocumented people to pick our food um, to make our economy work, they need to be considered an essential worker just like I am as a frontline physician. So essential worker needs to include teachers, it needs to include jail workers, it needs to include people that are, that are serving our food, cleaning our, our houses, cleaning our, our offices and that type of thing. And I think it's very important that the definition of an essential worker has a place high on the tiering of, um, of who gets the vaccine first. I also think we need to have special attention to high risk individuals, high risk settings, such as congregate living settings, homeless shelters, um, nursing facilities, and jails and prisons as well. Um, as we've seen in San Quentin in my own state, we can have incredible explosions of disease if we don't have protected populations in these dangerous congregate living settings. Uh, I would say that we do not need to be creating new systems of distribution. It's the worst possible idea in the middle of a pandemic to try to create something new. We have trusted partners, like I said, in community health centers. We have vaccine delivery systems. We, at the community health level, we've been delivering vaccines for years to our communities. Please use this, those of us who know what we're doing since we've been doing it already. Um, finally, uh, a couple of comments. I just wanna say being 10 miles from the border in Mexico, we've seen uh, incredible influence and I've seen it for years with infectious diseases, whether it be HIV or tuberculosis. Infectious diseases do not respect international borders. And it is foolhardy for us to think we can wall off the rest of the world and just vaccinate ourselves. We are not safe until all of us are safe. And we see this all the time. Infectious diseases cross back and forth. US citizens, thousands of them, live in Tijuana and come into San Diego to work. So if we're not paying attention to our international partners and the availability of vaccines for our international partners, um, it will come back to bite us. And finally, I, for full disclosure, I, my site is trying to recruit vaccine participants from communities of color, and it has really not been easy because of historical mistrust and historical abuses that I think we have to be transparent about. And when I do these community forums in English or in Spanish, it is striking when people say, how can you possibly expect me to be a guinea pig when time and time again, we've volunteered our, our community members and not seen the benefits of the research. So I think Medicaid, Medicare, private insurance companies, and then even programs for the uninsured need to acknowledge- I'm sorry to cut you off, your time is up. Uh, should be first in line. Thank you very much. Great, thank you so much. And thank you for your perspective on the ground. Uh, next up, we have Umer Shah from Harris County Public Health. Mayor Shaw, are you available? Yeah. Hey, we sorry. Can, can, can you guys see me and hear yes. me? Okay. I apologize. I was having trouble with my uh, video here. Um, all right, Ben, just let me know when you're ready. All okay. Set. Great. Thank you for having me. My, uh, my name is uh, Dr. Mayor Shaw. I'm the executive director for Harris County Public Health and the local health authority for Harris County, Texas. And I, I want to thank you for the opportunity to present our perspective today. I'm a past president of NHA and I'm also a past president of Techo, uh, which represents about 45 local health departments across Texas. Harris County is the third largest county in the U.S. with 4.7 million people spread over a geographic area larger than the state of Rhode Island. Not only are we large, but we're home to one of the most diverse communities in the nation. Along with our fellow public health departments in Texas, our department has been on the front line fighting this pandemic since the beginning of this year. We issued our first health alert January 9th, activated January 23rd, and since that time have worked tirelessly against all sorts of obstacles, which are not in the past, but continue to be in the, in the present. We continue also to believe that testing remains a foundation COVID-19 response. Epidemiology, contact tracing, are key public health tools go hand in hand with robust outreach and community engagement. 
We also see COVID-19 vaccination as the hope for a long-term solution to the continued preventive public health efforts and will eventually provide the way out, quote unquote, for COVID-19 for our nation. With this in mind, it is especially disappointing to see the U.S. reject the WHO efforts in global coordination for a COVID-19 vaccine. Let me start with a few assumptions. It is expected that any future COVID-19 vaccine will be in limited supply, especially initially, and it's crucial that we have clear and concise national strategy to allocate, distribute, and administer vaccines. Regardless, as with other pandemics, local health departments will play a key role in the on-the-ground partner operating and coordinating local mass vaccination sites and points of distribution with state and federal support. As highlighted in your draft report, lessons learned during the H1N1 pandemic are critical to COVID-19 planning for future vaccines and medical countermeasures. In 2019, our department released a grand, groundbreaking uh, report called Harris Cares 2020, which looked at a comprehensive community health assessment in Harris County and highlighted significant health inequities. In this report, it was made clear that communities of color have faced and continue to face disproportionate barriers to the opportunity for health. Life expectancy in our community alone ranges 24 years, the largest gap in Texas. These pre-existing inequities have only worsened since the start of COVID-19, first with our Asian American communities and subsequently with our African American and now most recently concerning our Hispanic and Latino communities. To model our cornerstone values of innovation, engagement, and equity during our COVID-19 response, HCPH formed a racial and ethnic approaches to COVID-19 and health task force. The REACH task force has been has been responsible for examining equity approaches across the nation and applying those locally in our COVID response, especially for disproportionately impacted communities. Placement of COVID-19 testing resources, we have utilized the CDC Social Vulnerability Index alongside weekly zip code level analysis of emerging hotspots, testing deserts, and emerging COVID-19 disparity trends. Just this past week, in the face of potential Hurricane Laura coming our way, we forwarded an equity-based COVID-19 testing strategy to our Harris County elected officials. Overall, we commend the National Academies proposed phased in approach for utilizing equity and social vulnerability as a cross-cutting consideration and vaccine allocation, especially its emphasis on utilizing science, ethics, and health in decision-making. It is our strong belief that in order to implement the framework effectively, coordination by public health of healthcare and community partners will be crucial. The vaccine allocations should also consider removing barriers that prevent others from getting vaccines, such as health insurance or access to health care. This upcoming flu vaccine season uh, offers an opportunity for strengthening relationships in preparation for COVID-19 vaccine, enhanced relationships among safety net providers, vaccine programs, and partnerships developed to expand COVID-19 testing should be leveraged as well. The current framework indicates that that you have drafted indicates that future reports will focus on implementation considerations, and these must take into account anti-vaccination concerns, especially in a state like Texas, where concerns for misinformation further driving decrease in uptake of vaccine remain a significant issue. There are five areas that I want to just uh, continue. And you're going to have to do those very quickly without any explanation. Just tick through them because your time is up. You got it. Goals of vaccine, uh, vaccine utilization. One, uh, tracking of the COVID-19 vaccine distribution and analyzing success for prioritized population, the f f efficacy of that vaccine strategy. Number two, national guidance and support for state efforts such as the immunization registry surge capacity with opt-in to opt-out and also technology supports. Number three, national vaccine education must be coordinated this flu season to ensure that locals can better combat conscientious objections to vaccines. Number four, emphasis should be placed on an equity-based strategy for engagement and allocation for those um, communities disproportionately impacted by COVID-19 with linguistically and culturally appropriate messaging and outreach. Number five, strengthening the support for local public health agencies that often are responsible for the last mile of vaccine delivery, given that many of these agencies are going to be very busy with other efforts in the midst of vaccine allocation. In summary, mass vaccination should have a transparent national strategy with input from state and local jurisdictions prioritizing the higher risk of uh, those at a higher risk for COVID-19 complications. Let me close by saying we need to ensure 
that local voice of public health, the boots on the ground who represent our communities across this great nation of ours are included in decision making and planning before those plans are enacted and finalized. Thank you for the opportunity to present today. Thank you. Thank you. And thank you for getting 20 minutes worth of information into seven. <laughs> <laughs> I can send it in writing to you. Thank, thank you so you, much. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and thank all those um, great panel uh, for representing state and local government and healthcare perspectives. We will now take a 10 minute break and meet you back at uh, precisely uh, 142. Yep. All right. Thank you. Did one of your colleagues log on as you or? I don't believe so. I came on and off when we went to break, so maybe that's it. Okay, I'll just um, demote that other uh, Michelle Hood. Okay. But I'm glad you're on. Okay. Yeah. Michelle, I was, I was just going to say, I think um, one of your colleagues may have registered you. Was it possible that someone else logged in? I, I saw there was a separate email link to your name when I, when I included you. Oh, I don't. So, Ben, are we ready to get started? I think we should. Okay, welcome back. And I must say that the earlier panels were very interesting. And uh, I can assure you that the recommendations you have made are going to be considered. They may not all be met to your satisfaction, but they will be considered. We're going next to a panel on health and medical professional organizations. Ben? Yes, first up we have 
Claire Hannon from the Association of Immunization Managers. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Okay, good. Um, good afternoon. My name is Claire Hannon. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Immunization Managers. Our members are the individuals in state and territorial public health agencies that strive daily to ensure the time. Claire, we've lost your sound. I can't hear you. We did for the, for the first couple seconds. Um, yeah, why don't we try moving to the next speaker and you can try to look into the audio and we'll come back. Okay, go Great. ahead. Okay, so next we have uh, Michelle Hood from the American Hospital Association. Can you hear me okay? Yes. Wonderful. Thank you. Thank you very much. So first of all, um, I'd like to thank uh, all of those who participated in the in the body of work that was released yesterday afternoon. Um, I think it's very well organized, very thoughtful, very uh, comprehensive, and in general, certainly uh, providing us a, a good starting point directionally for this important work that the country is about to um, undertake. So. Uh, start with a, a big thank you. Uh, uh, I am from the American Hospital Association. Um, the association advocates on behalf of its over 5,000 hospital and health system members. And we appreciate the opportunity to speak today and also the ability to submit written comments, which we will do um, in addition to my brief uh, uh, comments today. In general, we're uh, uh, supportive of the phased approach to distribution and administration, and especially the inclusion of healthcare workers in early phases of the uh, vaccine program. We hope that the plan um, as outlined will be modified as the science of the various vaccines evolves, and we learn more about the specificity of those vaccines to population segments that would best be served accordingly. As that occurs, uh, we also anticipate that a sophisticated communication plan will be essential to keeping stakeholders informed to the changing guidelines and plans. And those stakeholders, of course, including the public, vulnerable populations, public health officials, and the provider communities. One of the difficulties I think we've all experienced um, in the pandemic to date is the constant change and that there's, uh, you know, there's no fault in, in the change. We are learning as we go, but hopefully we will have established a, a better communication channel to keep people um, informed and on the same page as, uh, as these uh, uh, learnings um, inform us about the actions to be taken. And I'll say more about that in just a, a moment. Two items that either uh, were not included in the material or perhaps could be expanded upon as we uh, work on refinements is, uh, are as follows. Number one, mental health is a, a, a significant uh, risk. Um, and we didn't see that it was necessarily included as a comorbidity that might uh, put individuals at a higher priority. We're aware of the impact of isolation, uh, missed social socialization for children and older persons, and all of the uh, living with COVID that has impacted people who were previously living with mental health disorders and challenges. And so the long-term effect of, uh, of this on those uh, vulnerable populations, we hope uh, can be considered as we prioritize vaccine distribution. Second, uh, the science is not yet definitive enough to suggest that an antibiotic, antibody level uh, due to exposure to COVID or, or having a COVID, an active COVID in, uh, case actually equals immunity at the same level that a vaccine would provide. So unless research is completed between now and the time that the vaccines begin to be administered, it should not be a criteria that those who have developed antibodies from prior exposure, particularly high-risk individuals, individual, should not be excluded from groups 1A 1B and 2. At some point, however, science may tell us more 
and that could impact uh, us uh, rejiggering the prioritization and in fact uh, moving individuals that have had the COVID uh, um, exposure into a lower risk category and therefore extending the uh, limited supply of vaccines to a, a greater population. The correlation between uh, testing and vaccination is um, a difficult one uh, as well. The, uh, the, the fact that um, uh, we will begin to gather that data will be important as we uh, uh, reestablish priorities and communication about the vaccination protocol. My last point, um, the public really needs to hear all of this information from one leading voice that is speaking on these issues and making, everyone, making sure everyone is getting the same organized information from a source of truth. As uh, previous speakers have said, uh, the uh, lack of clarity and sometimes misinformation and conflicting information that has flowed has made a lot of uh, our hard work even more difficult. There are several comments in the document that suggest that if states decide to do something different or if private companies or employers require vaccines, that they will be allowed to create their own protocols and principles. Michelle, I'm sorry to cut you off, but your five minutes are up. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Thank, thanks so much. And thanks for mentioning the mental health aspects of this. This is very useful. Ben? Great. Uh, next up, we have Anthony Sue from the American College of Emergency Physicians. Thank you all for the opportunity to speak on behalf of more than 35,000 emergency physicians. I am Anthony Sue, MD, this year's chair of the Public Health and Injury Prevention Committee. And I'm here to comment on how emergency physicians can help assist on today's topic. The American College of Emergency Physicians believes EDs are uniquely positioned with public agencies for the work of mass immunization to ensure all people can be reached, including those facing homelessness and the underinsured for whom emergency departments may be their most likely source of care. With adequate financial support, emergency departments who have already faced the brunt of the pandemic can further help to provide vaccinations behind the highest risk individuals. Process structures for tracking effectiveness as well as safety and adverse event outcomes should be made accessible by all emergency departments. Background, we have a robust 24-7, 365 system for the distribution of preventative health care already. The emergency department vaccinates for tetanus, diphtheria, pertussis, rabies, and more. ASEP has provided thoughtful leadership supporting the frontline clinicians, nurses, and support personnel rapidly and continually since the start of the COVID-19 pandemic in the U.S. EDs with the Covered Project are already partnering with the CDC on studying vaccine effectiveness among ED staff. The VAERS, V-A-E-R-S, has already been in existence since the National Childhood Vaccine Injury Act 1986 and is administered by the FDA and the CDC. Here's some quotes from thought leaders within ASEP. Quote, the real tragedy will be those who are made to be unduly concerned into not taking it, then die from the disease or spread it to others who die. This is a situation where vaccine development as usual is counterproductive. Dr. Taylor, June 16th. Another quote, an ASEP council resolution was passed in 1998 advocating for using the ED for vaccinations. The ED has been recommended as a potential site for influenza and pneumococcal vaccines by the CDC and the ACIP, Dr. Martin, June, July 1st. The following are concerns regarding vaccine distribution that can occur in the emergency department, but also apply outside of the ED. Number one, at the bedside, utilization of shared decision-making tools regarding measurable risks and benefits of tests and therapeutics promotes adherence by ensuring individual agency. How can we best standardize this process while continually updating an easily accessible knowledge base at the bedside to rapidly address vaccination disparities? Number two, managing expectations of uneven vaccine availability can help reduce anxiety, strife, and concerns of unfairness. Rural and urban stakeholder representation, advice and consent will be necessary. Number three, understandably the FDA manages vaccine trials and while the CDC manages the information and science of the pandemic, which federal agency within the Department of Health and Human Services is best equipped to manage the efficient and equitable distribution of vaccines, lest each vaccine company negotiate with each health system and lead to much less equitable market-based scenarios as has been seen in certain instances with testing. Number four, when a system considers having more primary care providers, more than primary, care providers administer vaccinations, such as EDs, pharmacies, or urgent cares. There are state registries of vaccination, but not a federal one. What are the benefits and potential adverse implications of temporarily instituting a federal agent registry for vaccination against the SARS-CoV virus? Number five, consider the possibility of malfeasance, fear, and ignorance. 
If a person only needs one vaccine, will people get more than necessary, thus reducing supply? Number six, will there be security related issues regarding distribution throughout the country? Number seven, the quality of the COVID-19 information landscape has varied over time and by source. How will vaccine misinformation, intentioned or not, be managed by state and governments as, we, as well as new and old media? Number eight, last one. How can we leverage the distribution of vaccines for health and science moving forward? Can, could private public partnerships regarding health and science education utilize technologies such as kiosks for the less connected that can be continually updated, standardized, and distributed to address health and education disparities? Overall, I thank you again for the opportunity to speak on behalf of emergency physicians regarding the very timely discussion of vaccine distribution. And we look forward to working with the National Academies on providing advice and the means to help address the COVID-19 pandemic. You're on mute, Bill. I, I was saying this is the... Uh, precision and speed that we would expect from an emergency department. Oh. Uh, so thank you very much. Great. Next, we have Scott Knorr from the American Pharmacists Association. Good afternoon. I'm Dr. Scott Knorr, CEO of the American Pharmacists Association. We represent pharmacists in all practice settings, including community, hospitals, long-term care, physicians' offices, clinics, hospice, and government facilities. Thank you for providing a draft framework for the equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccines. We appreciate the committee's recommendation of an evidence-based phased allocation and prioritization approach to vaccine distribution. We strongly urge the committee to reconsider the placement of pharmacists in tier two in the allocation scheme. Pharmacists belong in tier one, Pharmacies and pharmacists in all practice settings are essential frontline healthcare providers and have been providing COVID-19 and related patient care since the coronavirus first appeared here. We're proud of the critical impact that our members have made to help our nation respond to the pandemic. Pharmacists have been on the front lines working with other members of the healthcare team and communities, ensuring medication access and availability to support continuous adherence expanding the availability of COVID-19 tests and administering vaccines to protect children, adolescents, and adults from vaccine-preventable diseases, including the flu, providing evidence-based information to other healthcare providers and patients on medications, delivering in-person and telehealth services to patients with chronic conditions, and compounding drugs to mitigate and prevent shortages. These essential public health protection efforts provided by pharmacists are critical to ensuring that high-risk patients, healthcare providers, and those who support critical infrastructure remain healthy to keep the country open and productive. Pharmacists provide direct patient care daily and will serve as key immunizers for persons at high risk of transmission. Pharmacists are the most accessible healthcare providers with close to 90% of the US population living within five miles of a pharmacy, including many underserved areas. And patients don't need an appointment to see their pharmacists, whether inner city, rural, or elsewhere. More than 360,000 pharmacists have been trained to administer vaccines. We're ready and able to meet the healthcare needs of our communities. Any successful vaccination plan for the equitable allocation of COVID-19 vaccines must involve all licensed pharmacists and pharmacies to defeat this virus. A pivotal CDC pandemic influenza vaccine study showed that national vaccine administration capacity increased to 25 million doses per week and the time to achieve 80% vaccination coverage nationally was reduced by seven weeks when pharmacists were included in the response. We have three recommendations for the committee to include in the finalized framework. First, to ensure that pharmacists are able to continue to provide critical care to patients, the framework must recognize pharmacists in all practice settings in tier one. The framework identifies clinicians and other workers in healthcare settings who meet the phase 1A risk criteria. Pharmacists meet three of the four criteria, including risk of acquiring infection, risk of negative societal impact, and risk of transmitting infection to others. Therefore, pharmacists fall in tier one, not tier two. Second, APHA strongly urges the committee's report include a primary recommendation that all licensed pharmacies are given a priority designation in federal and state vaccine allocation, 
distribution, and immunization plans. This should include prioritization of ancillary supplies and access to PPE in the delivery of care to patients and protection of our immunizing workforce. Third, the committee should recommend the federal and state vaccine distribution and immunization plans include a fully funded component for pharmacists and others to conduct community-based education and outreach campaigns to eliminate stigma, address vaccine hesitancy, and improve prevention and health outcomes for high priority and vulnerable patient populations. Pharmacists are trusted healthcare providers and that patient trust is key in educating and incurring patients to get vaccinated. Thank you again for your efforts. We strongly recommend that the committee engage the pharmacy community in any ongoing and process evaluations related to vaccine allocation and, and, and distribution. The American Pharmacists Association looks forward to continuing to work alongside all of America's heroic healthcare workers to defeat COVID-19. Pharmacists are healthcare providers in your neighborhood and on healthcare teams. We're at the front lines and are an essential part of the effort to vaccinate communities and prevent the spread of COVID-19 across the country. We'll be submitting more detailed comments for the record on behalf of the broader pharmacy community. Thank you. Thank you for this clear expression of a very important perspective. Ben? Next, we have Kathleen O'Loughlin from the American Dental Association. Hi, and thank you so much for allowing us to provide some comments. I uh, speak on behalf of the American Dental Association. I'm the executive director and CEO. And I speak on behalf of our 163,000 members and thank the committee for this opportunity to provide very important comment. Along with many of the speakers today, ADA seeks to ensure the most vulnerable at-risk groups, including Native Americans, Latino, Black communities, the institutionalized, medically and mentally compromised and at-risk elderly, are allowed early access to the vaccine. A healthy, essential healthcare workforce is vitally important in serving all of these communities of interest. And the ADA asks that the committee recognize dentists as critically important members of the essential healthcare workforce. In the early days of SARS CoV 2 pandemic, dentists were among the first healthcare providers to restrict practice. And this was done to reduce possible transmission rates, to conserve personal protective equipment for our medical colleagues and to continue to provide basic emergency care to reduce the burden on already over on hospital emergency departments. And currently over 95% of dental practices are safely and effectively providing comprehensive care to their communities. 58% of the population have a dental visit each year, over 170 million individuals. So routine care is essential healthcare and dentists and their teams are essential healthcare workers. Dentists evaluate and diagnose oral diseases that are directly linked to overall health. For example, a routine dental exam includes screening for oral cancer. Prevention is extremely important and early detection, as you know, can lead to early treatment. And this is especially important in the case of HPV related cancers, which have caused a dramatic increase in oral cancer uh, in the absence of traditional risk factors such as age and smoking and alcohol abuse. Delaying treatment for months or even weeks can make the difference between life and death. So oral health has always been associated with overall health and evidence now shows that gum disease is related to the incidence or severity of diabetes, cardiovascular disease, rheumatoid arthritis, anxiety, depression, dementia, and other systemic diseases. Furthermore, CDC recently reported that screening for systemic conditions could result in up to $100 million of healthcare expenditure savings annually. And finally, dental pain is the number one cause of missing work in school. It affects military read readiness and impacts the overall well being of the population. So, as essential healthcare workers, dentists and their teams also can play a role in expanding the nation's medical surge capacity. For example, some states, such as North Carolina and Pennsylvania, have already authorized dentists to screen patients for SARS-CoV-2. Several states such as Illinois, Minnesota, and Oregon also allow dentists to provide life-saving vaccinations. It is also worth noting that every year more than 31 million people visit a dentist and do not see a physician. 
This makes every dental encounter an opportunity to test or vaccinate those individuals for SARS-CoV-2 in states that currently allow it. According to a consumer survey from August of 2020, 15% of the public is reluctant to return for routine dental appointments until a medical breakthrough, like a vaccine, is available. Early access to a safe and effective SARS-CoV-2 vaccine will reassure that 15% of the American population that it is safe to resume routine dental appointments. Health and Human Services agrees with the Federal Emergency Management Agency that dentistry is an essential healthcare service and dentists and their teams, including the dental students and residents within the clinical operations of 66 U.S. dental schools and community health centers, are essential healthcare workers. So we appreciate your thoughtful consideration of how to allocate the early supply of the vaccine equitably and with the greatest positive impact on all of our communities. Thank you so much. Bill, you're muted again. This is being recorded, and so we will be going through this, but feel free also to send in uh, written notes on what you've just said. Ben? Great, thank you. Uh, before we move on to the next panel, uh, I wanted to circle back to Claire Hannon from the Association of Immunization Managers. Great. Thanks very much. Can you hear me? Okay, yes. great. Thanks for circling back. Um, good afternoon. My name is Claire Hannon. I'm the Executive Director of the Association of Immunization Managers. Um, our members are the individuals in state and territorial and a few large local public health agencies um, that work in immunization and strive to ensure the timely vaccination of every child, teen, and adult. We appreciate the opportunity to provide comments and really thank the committee for your commitment to quickly develop an overarching framework to assist in planning for the equitable allocation of COVID vaccines. Immunization program managers, sorry, my video I didn't realize it wasn't on. Um, immunization program managers are on the front lines of vaccine distribution planning, and they need this evidence-based guidance to assure success. Um, I wanna make three observations. I wanna share three observations I had upon reading the draft report. And just to state up front that these are observations I have not had an opportunity to discuss with my membership or vet with them due to the short time frame but we will submit written comments. Um, first, the acknowledgement of the COVID disease impact. I commend the committee for thoroughly exploring all the aspects of the framework and the principles on which the framework is founded. This approach acknowledges the significantly higher burden of COVID-19 infections and diseases among Blacks, Hispanics, American Indians, and Alaska Natives. The report also acknowledges the fundamental health inequities in COVID-19 and other health conditions are rooted in structural inequalities, racism, and residential segregation. I think this acknowledgement is critical. Um, it's really critical to, to establishing trust in these communities, trust in the public health and the providers that are going to be given, giving vaccine, um, trust in the vaccine itself. I'm concerned that the principle of mitigating health inequities when discussed alongside the principle of equal regard and fairness may cause confusion and blur this strong acknowledgement of the higher disease impact on certain populations. The committee notes a key lesson from the Ebola outbreak in West Africa. The lack of effective community engagement was among the barriers that delayed a rapid and effective response. State and local immunization program managers need to engage in these communities where the virus is impacting the most. These communities know the virus is infecting Blacks, Latinos, Native Americans, Alaska Natives higher than whites, and the hospitalizations and death rates are higher because they're experiencing it. Uh, state and local public health officials talking in these communities, engaging with leaders, church groups, employers, they need to have clear information and they need to be able to establish trust. They need to be able to explain the recommendations, to explain the priority groups. Um, they've got to acknowledge what these communities already know, that they've been hit harder by the disease. 
Um, and that's where I'm concerned about operationalizing the guidance and the logic of the committee. It's difficult to acknowledge health inequities and a strong association of COVID disease infection with race and ethnicity, but then communicate that with respect to the vaccine, all individuals are regarded equally. Um, second, I wanted to touch on the specificity versus the flexibility for states. The committee notes that the H1N1 vaccine program allows state and local jurisdictions flexibility to develop their own distribution plans. Um, and this is critically important. Um, workers that are essential to the function and economy of communities may vary from state to state, and strategies may vary as well. Like drive-through clinics might be great in sunny Florida, but not feasible in chilly North Dakota. Um, but this has to be balanced against the need for consistency. As the report notes, the decisions made by states in 2009 around allocation of vaccine within priority groups and when to broaden vaccination efforts beyond priority groups led to communication and um, challenges and confusion. Now, I think the vaccine supply is likely to be more limited in the early phase than the populations recommended to receive the vaccine without additional guidance on who to prioritize within those larger groupings in 1A and 1B. We could again see variants across states leading to confusion and communication challenges. Now, our hope is that we learn from the lessons of 2009 and apply um, final recommendations with more consistency while still allowing state flexibility. Um, third, I wanted to touch on translating the priority um, into outreach. While it seems entirely appropriate to prioritize people of all ages with comorbid underlying conditions that put them at significantly higher risk, in phase 1B, as the committee recommends. My concern is the challenge around operationalizing this. It would Sarah, be I'm very sorry, difficult. Your five minutes are up. Okay, it would be very difficult to operationalize this just because of the large numbers in the vaccine group when vaccine is scarce. Um, so I, I, I would encourage looking at operationalization challenges when, when finalizing the report. So thanks very much to, uh, for the opportunity to comment. And I also just wanted to say the guidance that will be coming out from you on risk communication and steps to mitigate vaccine hesitancy will be very much needed. Thank you. Thank you. Okay, thank you very much. And we're going to go to a new panel and looking at some of the particular problems of the older population. Ben? Great, first we have Luis Aronson from the University of California, San Francisco. Hi, thank you all um, for listening to so many voices. I actually feel like this is a model for the America uh, I'd like to be living in. Um, so this is terrific, thank you. Um, so I'm here to talk about old age, but I think if I have one point, it's this, that you're listening to a lot of groups and we're sort of grouped by subcategory. And I actually think these aren't separate interest group issues, but it's really the same sort of biases, conceits and constraints um, of our systems applied to different populations. So to my eyes, there are two unifying themes going on here. Um, and I'll just say also that I'm, I'm painting with a very broad brush here because I have colleagues speaking after me who will get into more specifics. Um, but so the two big unifying themes, I think across these subpopulations are intersectionality, which is really the synergistic impact of multiple disadvantages. Um, in human lives. And in terms of old age, 80% of deaths have been in older people. And just having scanned the people I can see here, um, let's be clear that the risk of COVID death starts going up at age 50. Um, and then it goes up significantly at age 60, and then it doubles again at 70, and then it is at its highest over age 80. And as my colleague Joanne Lynn likes to say, um, if we're not old now, we're all old people in training. Um, and, and the other thing that is often missed in these discussions is that you can actually be black and brown and old at the same time, and that turns out to be not good for you in this country. Um, so there's another issue here in addition to intersectionality, which is complexity, which sort of began as like the systems based cousin of intersectionality. It's like the multiple connections between components, but we actually now use this in reference to human lives a lot now, particularly older lives. Um, but it turns out if you look closely, um, and I say this as a as a clinician and doctor um, that the majority of human lives um, 
are this complexity, right? It's basically anything other than the sort of human that we studied when modern medicine began, which was an able-bodied white heterosexual, at least middle-class male between the ages of 20 and 50. And there's no, I don't want to mean any disrespect to people in that category, but that is the minority, right? The others are not. If you look at the health and human services list of vulnerable populations, it is the vast majority of people in this country. Um, so what I really hope for this panel and, and, and your recommendations is that we don't continue these mistakes. So we know that scientific research, including vaccine research, works best when you can control a lot of factors. The problem is when you control factors, you end up with a really narrow, maybe so-called ideal human that isn't most of us. Um, so I think the research has to start out in that complexity and intersectionality because those are the lives in which the results will be applied. Um, we've learned this the hard way at the start of um, research, you really had to be in that ideal category. And what they would say about women was that, well, we can't include them in the study because they've got these weird hormones. Um, and we can't include people of color um, because their lifestyles are different um, than ours, again, quote unquote. We can't include old people and young people. And then what happened when they applied the results of these studies, some of which yielded tremendous advances, um, was that they found that women and people of color had much poorer outcomes. And at first they blamed them for their uh, demographic attributes. And, um, but, but then in 1989, the NIH said, you must include women and people of color in studies. Now that hasn't gone as well as one might hope 30 years later, but at least they had a mandate. In the 1990s, they discovered that children were different from adults. So in 1998, they mandated the inclusion of children. When did they mandate the inclusion of elders, defined broadly as people over age 65 in, in clinical research? 2019, last year. Right? So bottom of the barrel, 80% death rate from COVID, really important. In terms of vaccines, we see this play out all the time. The CDC issues a vaccine schedule yearly, as I'm sure you all know. They acknowledge subcategories of children and adults, but not of elders. So vaccines are usually targeted based on your social behavior and your biology. So there are 17 subschedules for children. There were five for adults this year, they reduced it to four. There was a single vaccine schedule for people over age 65, as if any one of us doesn't know that biology and behaviors are very different um, between a 65 year old and an 85 year old and a 105 year old. No, no less different than between a two year old and a 12 year old or a 22 year old and a 52 year old. Ageism, plain and simple. Now for COVID in particular, we have seen intersectionality in two main ways. There was a study in the Journal of American Geriatric Society and there have been multiple others showing that if you control for everything else, you control for other diseases, you control for insurance type, you control for wealth, um, all sorts of other things. If your skilled nursing facility has a higher proportion of black residents, then the risk of COVID in that facility is at least twofold. Right, so you can be both these things and that's not good. Now there is a second important way in which this is interacting with old age, which is the people who work in congregate care facilities for the elderly are very often female, brown or black, um, so in many um, states also immigrants. Now, I'm, these I'm are sorry people... to cut you off, but you're okay. in your five minutes. Okay. Um... I'll just, can I have one quote from the flu? So this is from my local newspaper. Though people age 65 and older are the most vulnerable to flu, to which they're much less vulnerable than COVID, reporting their deaths is problematic. So we don't do it anymore because it would require too much time and money and their cases are often complicated by multiple health problems. That's not a reason not to provide care. That's a re reason to provide care. Thank you very much for this time. Uh, thank you for reminding about complexity. And at 84, I felt like you were talking right to me. Uh, ben? Next up, we have Timothy Farrell from the American Geriatric Society. Good afternoon. My name is Dr. Timothy Farrell. I'm a geriatrician and associate professor of medicine at the University of Utah School of Medicine and a physician investigator at the Veteran Affairs Salt Lake City Geriatrics Research Education and Clinical Center, or GREC. I'm honored to provide this testimony on behalf of the American Geriatric Society, or AGS, where I serve as vice chair of the ethics committee. Our committee developed the recent AGS position statement entitled Resource Allocation Strategies and Age-Related Considerations in the COVID-19 Era and Beyond. AGS appreciates the emphasis that the committee has placed on the healthcare workforce and older adults in its draft framework. 
AGS members work to improve health, independence, and quality of life, and to ensure that older adults have access to high quality health care that is free of ageism. The AGS believes that vaccination strategies should focus on achieving the greatest possible reductions in disease-related death and morbidity. We therefore strongly recommend that our national vaccine allocation strategy should do the following. First, prioritize the health workforce, broadly defined to cover workers across care settings, including in long-term care, assisted living, and other congregate living facilities, and home and community-based settings. Second, prioritize access for high-risk populations, including older adults, those living in congregate settings, people with chronic health care conditions, and communities of color. Third, avoid using age as a criterion given the diversity of the older adult population. We believe that is not the role of the AGS, this committee, or of government to assign different values to individual life based on age, income potential, or other factors. We respectfully recommend that the committee should instead consider the effect of vaccine distribution on public health, mortality, and decreasing demands on the healthcare system in general. I'll address each of these three points in turn. The AGS strongly recommends that the committee include an expansive definition of the healthcare workforce that is comprehensive as to type of worker and setting of care. Our United States healthcare workforce provides care not just in acute care hospitals, but also in nursing homes, assisted living, and other congregate living facilities, and at home and in the community. We must ensure that direct care workers, such as certified nursing assistants, dietary aides, and others who work in facilities where COVID-19 patients are cared for, are prioritized. This is in addition to the priority that will be given to health professionals, such as doctors, nurses, pharmacists, and social workers. Preventing infection in healthcare workers is an important public health intervention to decrease the exposure of all of us, but most critically, our vulnerable populations to coronavirus infection. We appreciate that older adults, people with chronic conditions, and others at high risk of dying from COVID-19 are prioritized in the draft framework. However, AGS would like to speak on behalf of all older adults, given our concern that portions of the underlying analysis that inform these recommendations lean on stereotypes that potentially devalue older adults. We refer specifically to the idea that age in and of itself is a potential criterion for making allocation decisions. Our current reality is that due to advances in our understanding of diseases and how to treat them, people are living healthy lives even when they have heart disease or other chronic conditions. Resting these recommendations on an analysis that does not reflect the complexity of how we age runs the risk that older people will be discriminated against because of their age when this framework is implemented. I would like to highlight four principles from the recent AGS position statement that are particularly relevant to the issue I just raised. First, age should never be used to exclude someone categorically from a standard of care, nor should age cutoffs be used in allocations. Second, to avoid similar biases, factors such as life years saved and long-term life expectancy should not be used since they disadvantage older adults and are often unreliable. Third, when assessing comorbidities, decision makers should carefully consider the impact of age, race, ethnicity, and social determinants of health. Fourth, resource allocation strategies must be transparent, applied uniformly and regularly, and rigorously reviewed. We strongly encourage the committee to expand its analysis related to age and fairness by incorporating these principles. In a just health system, resources are allocated equitably using criteria that treat similarly situated people the same. AGS appreciates the work of this committee and your focus and commitment to developing a fair and equitable strategy that is transparent and free of age or other discrimination. Thank you very much again for the opportunity to provide this testimony. And I would add that when it comes to how well we all age, it behooves us all to remember that it is often the ninth inning of life that is the most important. Uh, I'll, I'll say also the AGS will be providing uh, written comments similar to those uh, described here. Thanks so much. Thank you for a very good statement, Ben. Next up, we have Brendan Flynn from Leading Age. Hello, um, my name is Brendan Flynn and I am the Director of Medicaid and Home and Community-Based Services for Leading Age, for whom I am speaking today. Um, Leading Age is a national association representing more than 5,000 not-for-profit aging services providers. Our members include nursing homes, continuing care retirement communities, assisted living facilities, affordable housing communities, home health and hospice agencies, page organizations, adult day services, and more. So I am speaking today on behalf of the full breadth of our membership. Um, to start, Reading Age appreciates the high priority the discussion draft assigns to older adults and the workers who care for them. 
Ensuring that these groups have the care, PPE, and ultimately vaccinations are imperative to ensure are imperative to ending the COVID-19 pandemic. To that end, we support the inclusion of high-risk workers in healthcare facilities in phase 1A for the vaccine allocation. As noted in the report, these workers provide essential care and are often themselves exposed to COVID-19, sometimes without the PPE they need. Close to 800 workers in nursing homes alone and many others across settings have died from the pandemic, and this group clearly needs priority access to any vaccination. The committee lists multiple healthcare settings, including nursing homes, hospitals, assisted living, and home-based care such as home health. We support including these settings and believe staff at all levels, clinical and non-clinical, should be included. Further, we urge the committee to include community-based care workers as well, such as workers in adult day services or in PACE organizations. Community-based services provide critical support to older adults, including those with multiple chronic conditions and at high risk for COVID-19. Vaccinating workers in community-based health and long-term care settings would also help prevent disparities. A 2019 report from the CDC, for example, found that about 15% of adult day services participants are Black, and 23% are Hispanic, figures much higher than the 65 plus population in general. Moving on to older adults themselves, we thank the committee for including older adults in the congregate settings and living in congregate settings in the top tier. Nursing home and assisted living residents have experienced the brunt of the pandemic and along with others in congregate settings should be among the first to receive a potential vaccination. We do urge the committee to consider 1A level priority if possible for this population. Um, potentially for folks in this group in hotspot areas or those with the comorbid conditions at the highest risk for COVID-19. We also seek confirmation from the committee that this category includes 1.1 million older adults living in affordable housing and federally assisted um, communities. While quote, affordable housing is not mentioned in the report, older adults living there are at high risk for COVID-19 and face many of the conditions described in, um, in the report and, and have more chronic conditions than their, than their unassisted peers. Further, affordable housing communities are often more diverse with respect to race and ethnicity compared to other congregate settings. We ask the committee to confirm that older adults in affordable housing communities are part of Tier 1B, and we seek similar confirmation as it relates to older adults in independent living communities. Um, we also just want to quickly exp express support for um, the committee's recommendations on Medicare and Medicaid coverage for any potential vaccination, as well as the development of age guidelines by ACIC if needed. Thank you, and we will also be submitting written questions. Oh, Thank you very much. Uh, and I'm impressed with how people are really keeping to their time limits. Ben? Next, we have Nicole Lynch from Voice. Hello, my name is Nicole Lynch. I'm the public policy coordinator for a nonprofit, uh, Voice, in St. Louis, Missouri. Um, we um, are the provider of the long-term care ombudsman program, and we provide advocacy services to nearly 27,000 long-term care residents in greater St. Louis and Northeast Missouri. Um, Voice is one of only one, one out of 500 ombudsman programs across the country. Um, and we are concerned, expressing concerns to the committee because ombudsmen have been left out of group 1A as they are not considered long-term care facility staff. Um, because they are considered to be non-biased and work for outside organizations. Um, these ombudsmen work very closely with residents and the program is federally mandated by Congress in the amendments to the Older Americans Act. Every long-term care facility in every county across the United States has an ombudsman to serve that facility. Um, a small number of these are employed and funded through the local area agencies on aging, but most of the program is sustained by volunteers themselves. Um, the, what an ombudsman does, they go in and they advocate for nursing home residents. Um, they can detect signs of abuse and neglect, ensure residents' rights are being upheld, and they're critical in reducing hospitalizations for early identification of preventable health concerns, such as pressure sores, dehydration, and UTI. Um, it's a role that's incredibly critical to nursing home residents right now as they've been on lockdown for over six months um, and long-term care staff that are working there is stretched thin as staffing is limited. Um, this is especially prevalent in Medicaid facilities with primarily African-American residents. Um, the ombudsmen are at high risk for contracting COVID-19. As the report states, 80% of all COVID deaths have occurred in people over age 65 and nursing home staff and residents have been at the direct center of this. Um, the volunteers themselves are frequently older adults as it is a high time commitment. I know in Missouri, 
Um, it, each ombudsman will spend three to 10 hours a week providing advocacy services one-on-one -on -one with residents in the nursing home. And additionally, they have to go through in Missouri 50 hours of initial training and 20 hours of continuing education training, leaving this role primarily up to retired older adults as they are the ones with this time commitment. Um, we already have a very small volunteer pool as our ombudsmen are afraid to go back into the nursing homes and advocacy services have been very limited to these residents who are very vulnerable right now. Um, so we just asked the committee to consider this um, and providing them and putting them into group 1A as they are very high risk of working with nursing home residents and high risk themselves. Thank you. Thank you. That's very important information. So thanks for presenting it, Ben. Next, we have Mark Parkinson from the American Healthcare Association National Center for Assisted Living. Well, thank you very much. Uh, my name is Mark Parkinson. I am the uh, CEO of the American Healthcare Association and National Center for Assisted Living. Uh, we represent 10,500 skilled nursing facilities across the country, uh, as well as uh, 4,000 additional assisted living facilities across the country. We really appreciate the opportunity to provide input today. Um, I had a chance to read the draft report this morning and I was extremely impressed. I mean, it, it is really great to see such thoughtful work product. Um, super impressed with the work that you've done and, and uh, glad to, to try to give you some input to help shape it in, uh, in, in any way that we can. I think, you know, it's very clear that the impact on older people uh, and in particular older people that live in congregate settings has just been absolutely devastating. Uh, we have very good data on skilled nursing facilities because they, we are required to report every week. And so we now know that almost 200,000 people living in skilled nursing facilities have contracted COVID. That's an astonishing number when you stop and think that there are only about 1.5 million people in these facilities at any given time. 200,000 have contracted COVID. Um, even worse, of course, is that we know that the mortality rate for people that are, is over 80 years old is really high. And the average person that lives in one of our facilities is 83. The mortality rate is somewhere um, around 20%, perhaps even a little bit higher than that. We now have know that definitively through the reporting that we have almost 50,000 deaths in skilled nursing facilities. We don't have good data on assisted living buildings and independent living buildings because there's no uh, required reporting requirement, but it's very clear that there have been tens of thousands of deaths in those settings as well. And so for that reason, it's you know, obvious, and I don't think debatable, that any sort of prioritization of a vaccine really needs to try to figure out how to address this population. I think that the framework that was put together in the draft is brilliant. The idea of maximizing the benefits of what might be a limited supply of vaccines makes complete sense. And any sort of analysis of how you maximize the benefits would certainly include uh, older people in congregate settings as well as the people that take care of them. And that's, that's been a tragedy as well. We've lost almost a thousand caregivers to COVID and so they certainly need protection as well. We only have a couple of substantive comments. The first would be to completely endorse the comments of Brendan Flynn that he just gave from Leading Age, which is that it's not just skilled nursing facilities where these people live, it's also independent living facilities, assisted living facilities, and a number of other settings that older people are living together and we may need to make sure that we protect them all. And secondly, you may need to do some analysis based upon the effectiveness of the vaccine. If the vaccine is approved, but not completely effective, maybe only effective at a 50 or 60 or 70% level, we may need to give some serious consideration to what do we do about uh, healthcare workers and their immediate families that they go home and live with. Uh, what do we do about caregivers that come into facilities that might not otherwise be in a protected age group? So for example, we have a lot of family caregivers that are women 50, 60 years old that are taking care of their parents, some men, but it tends to be women. And we might, again, if the vaccine is not effective, they might not fall into a top tier uh, category, but we may need to give some consideration there. So finally, just let me conclude by saying that your work product, product is truly impressive. We will be submitting some additional written comments and really appreciate the opportunity to be heard. Thank you very much. And you're describing an absolute disaster that uh, uh, our hope, of course, is that vaccine is going to come much faster once it starts. That there won't be a long delay. Ben? Next, we have David Schles from the American Seniors Housing Association. 
Thank you, and uh, good afternoon, everyone. My name is David Schles. I'm the president of the American Seniors Housing Association, an organization with uh, 550 members. Uh, our members are involved in the full spectrum of senior housing, ranging from independent living to assisted living, memory care, as well as continuing care retirement communities. Uh, our industry houses and cares for approximately 2 million older adults, uh, and we have a workforce of approximately 1 million um, in these settings. Uh, Want to thank you for the opportunity to share our views today. Uh, upon review of the preliminary report, we are pleased to see healthcare workers and high risk seniors are recommended population groups for inclusion in the phase, phase one of this four phased uh, approach to the vaccine allocation. Um, I do want to echo some of the comments that have been made by uh, Mark Parkinson, as well as uh, Dr. Farrell and um, Brendan Flynn. Um, again, it would really point out that while the term long-term care is an appropriate term, uh, we really think there needs to be more specificity in the report um, so that independent living and assisted living and memory care really don't get overlooked. And uh, again, without belaboring this point, uh, the fact of the matter is, is that the uh, skilled nursing nursing home sector has received many um, uh, things from the federal government that uh, the rest of this spectrum has not received. Independent living, assisted living has been overlooked uh, throughout this process from the government with respect to PPE, rapid testing kits, et cetera. So um, I think that's a, a really important point to make. Um, I, I will just reiterate, uh, again, the prevalence of certain chronic conditions among the seniors housing population makes our residents a higher risk than other, adu other older adults living at home for COVID-19 infection, death, and other poor outcomes. Uh, according to the CDC, people with chronic kidney disease, chronic lung disease, diabetes, serious heart conditions are at a higher risk for severe illness from COVID-19. Uh, these conditions are prevalent among assisted living residents, uh, with 68% having at least one of these conditions. Uh, compared to private housing, uh, residents of independent living and assisted living are older and have higher rates of cognitive and functional impairment. Uh, our residents are well over the age of 80 on, on, uh, on average and often exhibit one or more of these chronic conditions. Um, so given these and other health risk factors, Senior living residents are definitely at increased risk of serious illness and death if infected with COVID-19. Um, I also want to just point out again that the need to quarantine and isolate residents to keep them safe from infection uh, can often lead to loneliness, which is of course linked to other health uh, risks, including dementia. Um, so our communities have uh, really limited and restricted uh, visitation with families and friends. Um, to and, and so, again, the risk of infection from outside parties is a real concern. And obviously, you've been reading about the challenges associated with visitation. Um, I want to talk a little bit about the workforce in these settings. Um, again, in senior living, independent living, assisted living, memory care, continuing care retirement communities, we have a range of individuals coming in. They're caregivers, nurses, housekeepers. Uh, dining staff, others, they're interacting with the residents on a daily basis. Um, they put themselves at uh, danger of either contracting the disease themselves or carrying the virus asymptomatically. Um, so again, I would really just, you know, reinforce that comment that uh, both the residents as well as the caregivers in these buildings and other folks that work on a daily basis, 365 days a year, uh, need to be included in this prioritization. Um, we can't serve our vulnerable seniors unless our staff are free from COVID-19. Um, in conclusion, uh, we hope that you will expressly include senior living residents and workforce in all references to long-term care or congregate care settings in the final report to be included in the phase one allocation. And we fear that without this um, clarification, we can be potentially overlooked, as has been the case uh, with dissemination of uh, rapid testing and supplies of PPE. We, we will be providing uh, a written statement and again, applaud your work and appreciate the opportunity to speak this afternoon.
Many thanks. We just we just keep learning and appreciate that. Ben. Next, we have Chad Wirtz from the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. Thanks, Ben. Um, my name is Chad Wirtz. I'm a pharmacist and chief executive for the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. And I want to thank the National Academies of Science, Sciences, Engineering, and Medicine for the opportunity to comment on behalf of the long-term care pharmacists and pharmacies that service the 15,439 skilled nursing facilities and the over 38,000 assisted living facilities, as well as older, other older adult and medically complex patient populations. The American Society of Consultant Pharmacists is the only professional society devoted to optimal medication management and improved health outcomes for all older persons in the United States and abroad. ASCP's senior care pharmacists and pharmacy members manage and improve the quality of life for geriatric patients and other individuals residing in a variety of environments, including nursing facilities, subacute care, assisted living facilities, psychiatric hospitals, hospice programs, and home and community-based care. First, I'd like to applaud the work of the committee in assembling a comprehensive approach to the COVID-19 emergency. The specific details regarding the fairness, equity, evidence-based, and transparent process of identifying the most appropriate tiers regarding vaccine allocation is impressive. We support wholeheartedly the inclusion of the skilled nursing facility and assisted living facility residents and healthcare workers in the initial phases of any allocation. As widely recognized and accepted, this population in this industry is the hardest hit by COVID-19. In congruence with these facts and the conclusions of the committee, I want to underscore the role of the long-term care pharmacies and pharmacists in successful deployment, administration, and reporting of any vaccine. Long-term care pharmacies and pharmacists have been and continue to be on the front lines of this pandemic and existing relationships with all of the 15,400 skilled nursing facilities and over 38,000 assisted living facilities. As, therapeutic approves, as therapeutics approved for use can be acquired, delivered, and administered using the existing effectively and efficient supply chain that is currently in place. Leveraging the close relationships that long-term care pharmacy and pharmacists have with skilled nursing homes and assisted living facilities, plans can be established to quickly and effectively get vaccinations administered within days of any emergency youth use authorization to the more than 1.3 million nursing home residents and over 800,000 individuals living in residential care facilities, as well as the over 2 million essential full-time nursing home employees and healthcare professionals, including pharmacists that work in these settings. We support the conclusions of this committee and emphasize that all long-term care pharmacies be included in the distribution process in phases 1A and 1B as existing, effective, and efficient resources to deploying the vaccine to all areas of the country. This is accomplished by allocating vaccine to the major wholesaler and distributors for rapid delivery directly to the long-term care pharmacies that directly service the skilled nursing facilities and assisted living buildings in every corner of the United States. We also emphasize that and want to ensure that pharmacists can support the other qualified clinicians in the administration and reporting of any vaccine. This is accomplished by establishing pharmacists as bona fide providers of vaccine services through Medicare Part B and Medicaid programs. Thank you for being proactive to the needs of our vulnerable older adult populations that reside in skilled nursing facilities and assisted living facilities, as well as other at-risk people in the community-based programs. And we will also be submitting written comments. Thank you. Many thanks. And we will do one more panel before we take another break. And we recognize from earlier comments that these panels don't necessarily follow, uh, but we have to, to put them in some sort of categories. So now we're going to look at the occupational risks. And Ben, who's our first First we have Debbie, sorry, Debbie Berkowitz from the National Employment Law Project. Hi, sorry about that. Um, thank you for this opportunity to speak at the public listening session of the National Academy of Sciences Committee on Equitable Allocation of a Vaccine for the Novel Coronavirus. I'm Debbie Berkowitz. I'm the Worker Safety and Health Program Director at the National Employment Law Project in Washington, DC. 
The National Employment Law Project is a nonprofit, nonpartisan policy and education organization that seeks to improve working conditions, such as workplace safety for low wage workers. Our work is focused on the many low wage industries that are disproportionately black and brown workers, as well as other workers of color, including immigrant workers and indigenous workers. I've spent 40 years in the field of workplace safety and health, and I was a senior policy advisor and chief of staff at Federal OSHA for six years before coming to the National Employment Law Project. I support the preliminary equitable policy framework that you have laid out in the draft document. I did want to inform the committee of the importance of prioritizing the vaccine for workers in the meat and poultry and agriculture industries, the critical infrastructure industries listed in the second tier of your framework of your draft framework. You may already know from news reports that COVID-19 has spread like wildfire through the nation's meat and poultry plants. We know that at least 41,000 workers in the industry have been infected and hundreds have died. And we know this is an underestimate since many plants are not doing testing and many states are not releasing data by industry. Nor does this total include the family members of workers who got sick and died from exposure to their relatives who worked in these plants. It was not inevitable that COVID-19 would race through and continue to race through these plants. It is because the industry did not implement the basic CDC recommendations soon enough. And sadly, in many plants, the basic CDC recommendations, such as for keeping individuals six feet apart, are still not being followed. Thus, it is still spreading in the plants. A poultry plant in California was just shut down this week after the public learned that eight workers had died in the plant and over 300 tested positive. Unlike other industries such as automotive that have huge assembly lines, who developed a safe and science-based strategy for reopening and work with their unions and work with their workers that included masks, social distancing on production lines and in break rooms and other measures the meat industry was not prepared for this pandemic, nor was it willing to rearrange its plans to keep workers and their community safe. The meat industry's failure to protect workers was aided and abetted by this administration's failure to issue any requirements for employers to implement to protect workers. OSHA, the agency that has totally failed, decided not to protect workers. It's a stunning, stunning decision when the spread of this disease could have been mitigated if the industry had been required to implement the basic CDC guidance of masks, social distancing, improved ventilation, and stepped up sanitation and hand washing. Thus, the disease has spread through the plants and into their communities. Their plants where a thousand of 2,800 workers got sick and they're still getting sick and many have died. The meat industry is disproportionately workers of color, black, brown, and refugee workers. These communities, as you heard earlier, also face a disproportional impact of the serious illness and death related to COVID-19, stemming from structural racism over generations related to access to healthcare. Thus, in conclusion, it is very important that these critical infrastructure workers who have been sacrificing their health and their lives while we all get to be socially distant be prioritized for the vaccine. But this should not relieve the meat industry nor relieve the federal government from their responsibility to protect workers and mitigate the spread of this de deadly disease. I just wanna thank you for your time. Thank you very much. It's another example, a tragic example, of people that don't actually have power to work at home or to not work. And so they're put in this uh, situation for, so th thanks for, for uh, reminding us of that. Ben? Next, we have Gary Ludwig from the International Association of Fire Chiefs. Good afternoon. My name is Chief Gary Ludwig. I'm honored to serve as the immediate past president of the International Association of Fire Chiefs. The IAFC represents the leadership of 1.2 million firefighters and EMS personnel in the United States. I want to thank you for this opportunity to speak today about the importance of prioritizing firefighters and EMS personnel with respect to the COVID-19 vaccination program. The IAFC strongly supports the National Academy's recommendation to include all firefighters and EMS personnel in phase 1A of the eventual COVID-19 vaccine, vaccination, or I'm sorry, vaccine distribution program 
and we thank you for that recommendation. Firefighters and paramedics are healthcare workers and are part of the healthcare delivery system. EMS calls are the vast majority of what we go on every day. We are the warriors at the tip of the spear. When you see all the outstanding work being done in the hospitals for COVID-19 patients by doctors, nurses, and others, please do not forget how those patients got there. The vast majority were transported there by ambulance. The fire service is the largest provider of emergency medical services in the United States, transporting some 30 million patients last year. Unfortunately, as of today, we have documented 79 firefighters and EMS personnel who have died from directly contracting coronavirus as a result of being infected on duty. Additionally, over 10,000 firefighters have been infected. Many of these patient interactions do not occur in a sterile environment, but are in the patient's home or on the street. This increases the likelihood of infection and exposure. EMS personnel provide hands-on patient care and routinely treat both low acuity medical emergencies as well as provide advanced life support services such as innovation and resuscitation. Even non-EMS trained firefighters are normally trained in CPR or in close physical contact with members of the public when providing CPR, rescuing them from car accidents or interacting on fire scenes. The IAFC urges the National Academies, National Academies to maintain the placement of all firefighters and EMS personnel in priority group 1A for receiving the COVID-19 vaccine. As we face increases in the number of COVID-19 patients and the continued hurricane and wildland fires we've been seeing, we must protect our first responders. The National Academy should urge the federal government to require states to adhere to federal prioritization schedules. Firefighters and EMS personnel routinely cross state lines as part of the mutual aid responses. This is especially true for responses to major disasters such as the ongoing wildland fires in California, and the recent response to the Hurricane Laura event in Louisiana. Prioritizing first responders in one state and not another will lead to confusion and uncertainty regarding the risks faced by firefighters and EMS personnel. Lastly, the National Academy should consider the role that firefighters and EMS personnel can play in administering the COVID-19 vaccine to the public. Fire stations and fire EMS personnel are already being used as strategically located sites for COVID-19 testing in many communities. Fire departments are also providing COVID-19 testing for some nursing home residents and staff members. These medically trained and equipped personnel could assist in vaccine administration and in some fire stations are even drive-through capable. The IFC applauds the National Academies for their difficult work in developing this strategy. In closing, the IFC is ready and willing to assist the National Academies in any way possible. Thank you again for this opportunity. Thank you very much. As a former firefighter myself, this was one of the easier decisions. Ben? Next up, we have Scott DeMauro from the National Education Association and the Ohio Education Association. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Scott DeMauro. I'm a high school social studies teacher from Columbus, Ohio, and president of the Ohio Education Association. I'm speaking today on behalf of the National Education Association, the nation's largest professional employee organization committing to advancing the cause of public education. NEA's 3 million members work with students at every level of education, from preschool to university graduate programs. NEA has affiliate organizations in every state and in more than 14,000 communities across the United States. The NEA appreciates the work of this committee to develop this framework for vaccine allocation to assist policymakers in planning for equitable allocation of vaccines against SARS-CoV-2. The NEA welcomes this opportunity to present several comments today and will submit expanded written comments by Friday. I would like to begin by noting that the NEA believes that vaccines are essential medical tools in preventing infectious diseases. Vaccines must be pervasive to be effective. We believe that vaccination guidelines from the American Academy of Pediatrics and Centers for Disease Control and Prevention should be followed by educators, parents and guardians, and students. State legislatures should establish clear guidelines for waivers that minimize the number of unvaccinated individuals to those necessary due to documented medical conditions. With respect to the discussion draft of the preliminary framework for equitable allocation of a COVID-19 vaccine, 
we strongly support the broadest description of school staff, which includes more classroom teachers, paraeducators, and other education support professionals, specialized instructional support personnel, librarians, administrators, and higher education faculty and staff. All staff who return to work in education work sites, including schools and campuses, are at higher risk of COVID-19 infection and must be protected from the virus with non-pharmaceutical interventions before the vaccine is available. We agree wholeheartedly that it is important to include teachers and other school staff relatively early to facilitate the reopening of schools and protect the most high-risk adults. We respectfully encourage you to broaden this crucial target by explicitly including faculty and all other employees of institutions of higher education. Indeed, as the discussion draft notes, many professors and other university employees are older or have underlying health conditions. We further urge you to, to include all education employees in phase 1B in recognition of the crucial role these institutions play and the underlying vulnerabilities of many of the employees who work in them. We strongly agree with the draft's report statement, the draft report statement that exposures in school settings is very difficult to control, especially when providing care or education to young children. We also support the draft's conclusion that school staff who are at higher risk because of age, crowded conditions inside facilities and other factors should be vaccinated in phase 1B. As noted above, we urge that all education employees be vaccinated in this phase. We strongly support the continuation of these non-pharmaceutical interventions after vaccination of staff and students until there is clear scientific evidence that schools are no longer a source of virus transmission. Nothing is more important than ensuring that we return to safe and equitable in-person instruction. And the work represented by the discussion draft is an important step in that direction. It is crucial for any vaccination plan to incorporate the voices of frontline workers, including educators. And we thank you for giving us the opportunity to speak with you today. Thank you very much. Thank you. And you remind me that uh, vaccines will not be a substitute for other public health measures. And we have to keep saying that. Uh, you also remind me why this is a living document, because we keep learning new things about what happens in schools. So thank you. Ben? Next up, we have Alexis Guild from Farm for Justice. Good afternoon, and thank you for the opportunity to participate in this listening session. My name is Alexis Guild, and I am the Director of Health Policy and Programs at Farmworker Justice. Farmworker Justice is a national advocacy organization that aims to empower farm workers and their families to improve their living and working conditions, immigration status, health, occupational safety, and access to justice. We work with farm worker community based organizations, migrant health centers, labor unions, legal services providers and local, state, and national organizations. Farmworker Justice has a long history of working with farm workers to improve their health and access to healthcare. Farm workers are critical to our nation's economy and food supply. As essential workers, they're at the front lines of the COVID-19 pandemic. They're risking their own health and safety to continue to work to support their families and to ensure the continuity in the nation's supply of fruits and vegetables. Their working and living conditions make them especially vulnerable to COVID-19. In the fields, orchards, dairy farms, and produce packing houses, farm workers must often work close to each other. They often have limited access to hand washing stations in the fields, and many farm workers share transportation to and from the fields. Due to their low wages, they tend to live in crowded shared housing, either provided by their employer or in their communities. It is difficult for farm workers to protect themselves against COVID, in part, because many employers have not put in place protections that would reduce transmission. The failure of the federal government and most states to enact mandatory safety standards to address the pandemic means that many agricultural employers do not take recommended actions issued by CDC and other public health experts. As a result, many farm workers are testing positive for COVID-19 across the country and a number of farm workers have died. Farm workers face numerous barriers to healthcare access, and these barriers have been magnified by the COVID-19 pandemic. The majority of farm workers lack health insurance and access to regular medical care. Due to their geographic isolation and lack of public transportation, many farm workers face difficulty seeking medical appointments. Generally, 
farm workers do not have access to paid sick leave and are unable to take time off work to seek medical care. Working long hours, six or seven days per week is common. Fear and misinformation are rampant. Farm workers are not necessarily receiving accurate information about COVID and many are unaware of their access to paid sick leave under the Families First Coronavirus Response Act. Due to stigma or fear of employer retaliation, workers may be reluctant to get tested for COVID or report if they have symptoms or have been in close contact with someone who is COVID-19 positive. We appreciate and support the National Academy's designation of critical risk workers, such as farm workers, as a priority for COVID vaccine allocation. Farm workers are at substantially high risk of COVID exposure due to working and living conditions that are often beyond their control. But prioritizing farm workers for vaccine allocation is only the first step to ensure access to a COVID vaccine. A comprehensive and innovative vaccine strategy must be developed that addresses their social determinants of health and responds to the unique needs of farm worker communities. We encourage collaboration with community-based organizations in the development and implementation of a vaccine strategy for farm workers. Their expertise is crucial to ensure widespread allocation and adoption of a vaccine by farm worker communities. Community-based organizations are trusted sources of information and have reaches into the community that the healthcare system, such as hospitals and health departments may not have, especially for farm workers who live in the more rural areas and therefore are more isolated from community resources. Employers should be encouraged to provide farm workers with accurate information, to engage with their employees and farm worker organizations to reduce exposure and respond to COVID-19, and to help ensure equitable access to vaccines. It's also important that the CDC provide vaccine information in formats that are widely accessible for all literacy levels in languages that are spoken by farm worker communities. This does not only include Spanish, but also indigenous languages from central and southern Mexico and Guatemala. Farm worker justice is happy to be helpful to ensure the effectiveness of vaccination programs in agricultural communities and workplaces. Keeping farm workers healthy should be a national priority. Farm workers should have comprehensive and equitable access to a COVID-19 vaccine and achieving that goal will take special efforts due to the challenges faced by farm workers, their families, and their communities. Thank you. Well, thank you for your advocacy of a group that is often marginalized. I appreciate that. Ben? Next, we have Peter Matz from the Food Industry Association. Thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Peter Matz, and I'm here representing FMI, the Food Industry Association, where I lead our food and health policy efforts. Uh, first and foremost, I, I, I want to thank the committee and also the National Academy's project staff for all of the hard work that's being put into developing a framework for COVID-19 vaccine allocation dis and distribution. From watching your virtual deliberations to date, two things became abundantly clear very quickly. First, the challenge of rapid vaccine development, testing, and approval is matched by the challenge of expedited distribution, allocation, and prioritization of populations and individuals. And second, the federal government clearly found the right group to take on this unprecedented challenge, or, or perhaps it was the National Academies. But regardless, uh, please know FMI appreciates all of your time and hard work. By way of background, as the National Food Industry Trade Association, FMI works with and on behalf of the entire industry, from retailers who sell to consumers to producers who supply the food, as well as the, a variety of related critical services including supermarket pharmacies, which is also a big part of what we do uh, to advance a, a safer and more efficient consumer supply chain for both food and pharmaceuticals. In total, FMI member companies operate roughly 33,000 grocery stores and 12,000 pharmacies, ultimately touching the lives of more than 100 million U.S. households per week and representing an industry with nearly 6 million employees. Having said that, FMI appreciates the opportunity to share insight from our members and offer feedback for your consideration as this process continues. First, as you know, the federal government designated the food and agriculture sector as part of the nation's critical infrastructure to keep the food supply chain running and Americans nourished during the ongoing health crisis. Your draft preliminary framework, which is extremely thoughtful and impressive, um, 
lays out a four phase plan for vaccine prioritization where food and agriculture essential workers are prioritized in phase two after front uh, after frontline healthcare personnel first responders and certain high risk individuals thank you very much for recognizing the importance uh, of prioritizing food and agriculture industry essential workers in order to protect uh, the food supply. Prioritizing vaccinations for these workers will help keep supply chains operating while those designated to receive the vaccine later continue to observe safety and distancing measures in their communities. However, pharmacists and pharmacy staff are also grouped into phase two, which we see as concerning. Given the success to date of pharmacists administering vaccines, serving as knowledgeable and accessible immunization providers within their communities and collaborating with public health and other providers, we feel a successful vaccination plan should actively involve pharmacists. Many studies show the, the importance of pharmacies and pharmacists in the deployment of vaccines and treatments, and even CV, CDC researchers found that 80% of the nation can be vaccinated seven weeks sooner when pharmacies are included in the vaccination deployment model. It's important to remember that 90% of Americans live within five miles of a pharmacy. So again, we think it's critically important to empower pharmacists to be part of the COVID vaccine solution. And therefore we believe pharmacists should be given priority one priority, a uh, phase one priority, excuse me. Additionally, given how well positioned pharmacists are, are to expand COVID vaccinations, the federal government should issue guidance authorizing pharmacists to order and administer COVID vaccines to people of all ages, just as it authorized pharmacists to order and administer COVID tests. Although pharmacies are authorized to provide adult vaccines in all 50 states for flu, pneumonia, and shingles, to name a few, there are some limiting state restrictions that still exist, which could prevent pharmacists from immediately providing a COVID vaccine to all patients. So again, with 90% of the US population living within five miles of a pharmacy, and pharmacies already reaching underserved and vulnerable communities, sometimes as the only uh, um, local provider of care, pharmacy-based vaccinations means reaching more citizens in neighborhoods nationwide, including communities disproportionately impacted by the virus. So this pharmacist author authorization is extremely important. I apologize if you can hear the baby in the background, I promise it's not a hostage. Um, I'll be quick to finish. It's also really important that your final framework takes into account associated equipment needs and supply sources. We really appreciate the amount of attention cold chain storage has gotten as FMI members agree that could be a significant challenge. However, especially following what's likely to be a bad flu season, our members are also concerned about the potential for shortages of ancillary materials needed to provide immunizations including hypodermic needles, syringes, disinfecting wipes, glass vials, stoppers, and, and PPE, especially gloves. Um, with that, again, FMI thanks the Ad Hoc Committee and the National Academies for the opportunity to provide input on this critically, critically important initiative. And if you have questions about these comments or would like additional information from FMI members, we're always happy to be a resource. Thank you, thank you, thank you. And now to get to the hostage. Uh, sorry about that. Well, thank you, and uh, uh, thanks for bringing up the need for other equipment and supplies, because if these first vaccines really require minus 70 degrees centigrade, uh, that's going to put a burden on the delivery system. And for your first comments, never underestimate the uh, power of people addicted to food. Ben? Uh, next, we have Rebecca Rindel from the American Federation of Labor and Congress of Industrial Organizations. Hi, good afternoon, everyone. Uh, thank you for organizing this forum, uh, for releasing the draft framework, and for having a special panel on occupational risk. <clears throat> I'm this, uh, Rebecca Rindel. I'm the Safety and Health Director at the AFL-CIO. Uh, we represent 55 national and international unions, labor unions, who represent 12 and a half million workers in pretty much every major industry across the country. I work on many workplace safety and health issues and hazards, uh, but this one is clearly unique uh, 
you know, one, the workplace exposures are so high, uh, and two, that the spread of the virus between workplaces and communities are so interconnected. We already know and we've seen evidence that reducing the spread in the workplace is the major contributor to reducing um, community spread of the virus. And we know that in locations where community spread of the virus is high, workers are at greater, greater risk of catching the virus in their workplace. So we urge caution um, uh, against using theoretical public health models and limit ourselves only to exposure scenario models of the past and past viruses that do not take into account current data that we have. Uh, current COVID data, 19 data, uh, point to major workplace exposures and outbreaks, and we're happy to follow up with the committee and, and provide some more data sources to the committee um, if that's helpful. I have five main points about the framework uh, for now. Um, one is we urge the committee to focus on exposure scenarios, not just on job classifications that put people at the most immediate and greatest risk. Uh, the pandemic, this pandemic has ravaged the country for six months and so many major outbreaks are being in workplaces that have key exposure factors in common. Um, working with, these are working with confirmed suspected COVID-19 uh, people with confirmed or suspected COVID-19, um, working close to those who are unknown, uh, unknown status, working close together, working indoors and with uh, poor ventilation, working in these scenarios for long durations, uh, lack of effective workplace protections, which are widespread right now, including engineering controls, administrative controls, PPE, um, real respiratory protection, lack of real workplace standards. Uh, we want them to focus on actual high-risk workers and scenarios, essentially, um, which could be dependent on their job tasks. Uh, we urge, second, we urge the committee to look at work with states and localities who have been specifically collecting workplace exposure and illness data and use these in major outbreaks um, that have been in the news and through other investigations as a model for high-risk industries and health disparity issues that exist with workplace exposures. Three, we urge the committee to recognize the complexity of the power dynamic in the workplace between employers and employees and existing workplace policies and agreements. These are complex settings when it comes to addressing health protections. Uh, and labor knows that because we've been doing it for a long time. Uh, and in addition, addition to the ethical challenges described and mentioned already here today, based on the lessons from the past, there are key additional challenges to consider um, not just in the distrust of the vaccine, but there's a need to consider the additional tension this time that has been brought to the rush and the pushing of various vaccines and development before they have gone through required testing and approval and tying this with the need for ensuring safety, efficacy, specificity of the vaccines before they're allocated. Uh, and that high risk workers do wanna be prioritized, but they also do not wanna be test subjects. Four, given all the above, there needs to be dedicated input and involvement in the decision making recommendations and requirements from workers and their representatives. Um, using this time now to connect and engage with the unions and these other groups at the national and local levels. Um, at the national level, even where workers aren't represented, unions do know these industries. Um, if you know, in different localities. Um, and in states where the distribution will occur, there will be different priorities for different states and working through those worker groups as states are, are is critical. And lastly, number five, um, allocation must be done in coordination with vigilant real-time monitoring of outbreaks and heightened risks with clear coordination and organization with access to medical follow-up, especially for some of the more vulnerable working populations that are rightly targeted in the framework. Um, we heard the need for unified messaging, but there needs to be targeted messaging as well. And for now, we should be educating people about the importance of the vaccinations, encouraging them to get vaccination uh, if and when it's set, safe and effective, it's available, a uh, vaccine is available. Um, and the vaccine structure to protect workers must be accompanied with a broader frame of strong workplace protections. We're happy to work with the committee going forward on sources of information, connecting you with worker representat representation and anything else that you need. Thank you so much uh, for your time today. Thank you. And uh, thanks for your offer because unions can be very useful as being a trusted source for the workers on what they should be doing. Ben? Next up, we have Miley Trevino Saceda from Alianza Nacional de, uh, de Campesinas. Good afternoon. Uh, this is Mili Trevino Sauceda, and uh, I want to thank you 
for allowing me to present in front of the National Academies on the, uh, uh, the, the committee that I'm in front of uh, for the public listening sessions on the equitable uh, allocation of COVID-19. I represent Alianza Nacional de Campesinas and uh, by representing Alianza, we have 15 organizations in, ele in 11 different states uh, here in the United States. And that means that we're representing more than 700,000 Farmaco women and their families. Uh, and um, my statement here is that during the first half of 2020, our communities uh, faced unprecedented social and economic distress. Essential farm and food system workers historically underserved, uh, tribal and, and beginning farmer, family farmers and ranchers in rural and immigrant communities of color are especially vulnerable to the gaps in support from the congressionally provided relief programs to date. The coronavirus pandemic has exposed the vulnerabilities of our rural and agricultural communities and systemic inequities leading to the inaccessibility of resources for immigrants, farm workers, and small scale farmers. It is imperative that these most vulnerable frontline uh, communities are included in vaccine efforts as soon as the vaccine is made available. Tens of thousands of farm and food system workers have been exposed to COVID-19, including over 4,500 reported positive COVID cases nationwide among agriculture workers and their families. Over 16,000 reported COVID cases in 239 meat and poultry processing facilities. Thousands of uh, documented uh, cases in or near farm labor communities, including over a thousand positive cases in the farm labor community of Immokalee, Florida. Due to the lack of employer protection in the, in the workplace, low wage, high rent, and the substandard and crowded living conditions for farm workers and other workers in rural agricultural areas least equipped to respond to this deadly epidemic uh, have been disproportionately affected by the virus, according to the National Center for Farm Worker Health. As of August 31st, 98% of rural counties in America have reported uh, uh, positive uh, COVID cases uh, and 70% um, uh, had reported one or more deaths. More than 655,000 rural residents have tested positive for COVID-19 and 15,047 deaths among rural Americans have been attributed to the, to the disease. Many farm and food chain workers lack access to healthcare or fear accessing medical services. Concerns uh, particularly heightened uh, among undocumented workers and uh, who comprise uh, about half of the country's crop, farm worker labor force, and are subject to immigration enforcement. These gaps become all the more pro pronounced along gender lines as immigrant women of color and pregnant people uh, increasingly comprise to uh, the spike of COVID positive cases. Therefore, it is important uh, to have vaccines made publicly available in a way that will reach workers and their families. Uh, that means it's, it is critical that, is, uh, that in making vaccine distribution plans, the organizations representing these frontline workers be integrally involved in making the plans. I request my full statement be accepted to the record. Again, on uh, behalf of, um, of Alianza Nacional de Campesinas, I do want to uh, say as my conclusion part that um, farm workers, even though we're called uh, essential workers, we have never been treated as essential workers. Just to, to be on the record, um, we're not even part of the Fair Labor Standards Act. Uh, it's, it's very clear since 1938, we're in year 2020 and we're not, we're not there yet. Um, and uh, we will be, be, be very happy to be a resource representing rural and farm worker communities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And you remind me of what I said at the, at the beginning, that this pandemic has really disclosed the fault lines in our society. So thank you, Ben. Thank you.
Yeah, ending this session, we have Randy Weingarten from the American Federation of Teachers. Thank you. Thank you, David. So my name is Randy Weingarten. I'm honored to be here. Um, in my and normal life, I am the president of the American Federation of Teachers, um, who would have loved to be at lots of school openings uh, this week, but because of the pandemic, we are not. We represent 1.7 million people who work in pre-K um, through 12 education, higher education, healthcare, and public service. And to, we thank you for this opportunity to provide commentary on the draft preliminary framework. Since the end of January, our union has been supporting our members through their struggle to balance serving those who rely on our work with the safety of ourselves and our families. Our members have lived and learned so much in the past few months, as I'm sure all of you have. So number one, let me say we applaud the committee for crafting a vaccine allocation framework built on principles that include transparency, fairness, evidence, equal regard, and mitigation of health equities. We know the initial production of vaccine is likely to be insufficient um, in quantity to permit every person to be vaccinated, so it is really important what you've done. There's a lot of fear and confusion right now in the current political environment, and people need a process that they can understand and trust. Allocation of vaccine must be conducted in a manner that is fair, transparent, protects those most at risk, and takes those principles of equity into account. So if I haven't said thank you enough, I am saying it again and again. Number two, if our educators and healthcare workers have learned anything this year, it's the importance of comprehensive mitigation strategies in our communities. We all want to reopen our economy and find a new normal. And I am encouraged by the multiple references in the framework to the need for a comprehensive strategy, even after a vaccine and, a, and quote, an effective vaccine is available. The committee sensibly acknowledged the need for preventative policies and equipment the, and the importance of PPE for exposed workers. Too many people have been lost because of supply chain gaps, inconsistent federal guidance, lack of planning, and lack of enforcement by OSHA. The importance vac of vaccination is one piece, but it's only one piece in an overall strategy. Number three, the committee has clearly given a great deal of thought to the criteria for allocation. Our members in healthcare, correction, and education have seen that frequent and sometimes unmitigated exposure to COVID-19 can be deadly. We have, by the way, 200,000 members in healthcare and over 50,000 members in corrections. I've had too many conversations with too many AFT families after a member has died after contracting the virus at work. In every strategy discussion, in every news interview, and in reviewing this framework, I carry those devastating moments with me as you hear from my voice. It's clear that great time and attention was given by you to ensure a fair, equitable, and evidence-based outline for how this precious quantity-limited resource might be doled out when the first doses become available. I implore you to reconsider placement of educators and school staff in this phase two, since we are going and being the first real wave in, um, in buildings and in person and inside of everyone in the nation. As noted in the draft, schools are necessary for maintaining core societal functions. And while it is true that schools can th theoretically open remotely, and many are, in-person instruction much forcibly is happening in communities right now. You've noticed that we have tried to renegotiate and negotiate this in different places, but there are many too many places like in Florida and Texas and Mississippi and Arizona where you see um, this kind of forcible in school and where you see people getting sick. Um, I just was off the phone with people in New York State where we are still fighting in over 200 districts to get a mask requirement. We have, for example, 25% of educators in high risk categories. We know that there is a higher number of kids who are being hospitalized from COVID. I can say go on and on and on, but schools are reality 
that could potentially be super spreaders. And we really need to make sure we don't pit learning versus living. And we are asking you to reconsider putting us or putting education in phase two. Schools are reopening. In some areas, they're reopening in a way that may not be safe. You see today, we are all across the country demanding safe schools. We and the NEA and others will continue to do this over and over and over again. So please, I know that schools are in phase two. I am asking you to see if you can reconsider the allocation to phase one. And I, again, thank you, thank you, thank you for your time and for your focus on all of these issues. Thank you. Thank you for your thank yous. And uh, we're going to take another break. Uh, there are a couple of things that I'll say. First, that uh, so many of you have emphasized, listen to the grassroots, and we're going to take that seriously. Uh, some of you have emphasized there is a system in place, use it. And that makes uh, solid sense. And for those of you who are concerned, these will be recommendations. But the real decisions are going to be made at CDC, at the state level, the county level, the Native American level, the city level. They're the ones that are going to modify these depending on the local conditions. So you can be reassured that we're not making recommendations at the periphery that people have to, to follow. They have to follow the recommendations and then modify them for their own conditions. Okay, we are going to take a break, and um, this group has been so disciplined. Let's return at, at uh, 4.34 and 40 seconds. Thank you.
Can you hear me? Yes. Okay. Um, welcome back. And um, we will now move to our sixth panel. And um, our panel will be talking, providing public comment on special populations. So we look forward to hearing from this panel. Great. First up, we have Eliane Anderson from Schoolhouse Connection. Hello, good afternoon, everyone. My name is Alian Anderson, and I'm very happy to be speaking on behalf of Schoolhouse Connection, a national nonprofit organization with the mission of overcoming homelessness through education. Well, I would like to bring attention to you all a subset of homeless families and youth, particularly those who classify as homeless under the McKinney-Vento education definition of homelessness, or those who lack a fixed, regular, and adequate nighttime residence. So this includes persons who are sharing housing with others due to a loss of housing or some economic hardship. And this is a population which is historically grossly undercounted um, when taking totals of um, persons experiencing homelessness. So according to a federal report that was published by the National Center for Homeless Education, um, while 7% of homeless youth um, experience unsheltered homelessness, 74% of students who are experiencing homelessness were found to be living in um, congregate settings, um, such as like temporarily staying with other persons. These situations are often crowded, um, unstable, and do not provide opportunity for persons to safely and effectively self-quarantine. Um, they are very precarious and volatile, so this also leaves this population to be very mobile. In fact, in a recent congressional briefing that was co-hosted by Schoolhouse Connection, we heard um, directly from a parent who had been experiencing this exact situation um, during the pandemic. Um, and I quote from her, I'm staying in someone else's house who's afraid of COVID-19, which is difficult. Me and my kids are sleeping on the floor and my kids are tired of sleeping on the floor. And also I did get sick. I had to quarantine for 14 days in somebody else's house. That was very difficult. They gave me until the end of July and then I have to go. And I respect that. Some people, they don't want to catch COVID-19. They are afraid because I still have my part-time job and I work in a grocery store. People at the grocery store and at my job at Amazon have been catching COVID. So every day I worry about catching it and bringing it back home to the bringing it back to the home, and I also don't want to bring it back home to my kids. This particular quote not only highlights the plight and the threat to health and well-being that is faced by persons who um, do find themselves temporarily staying in the homes of others, but also the fact that um, these persons often are the same people who have been working in jobs that have been deemed essential since the onset of the pandemic, putting um, them and those around them at heightened risk of infection and transmission of COVID-19. Including this population amongst those who will receive early allocation of the COVID-19 vaccine is necessary to reduce the numbers of those um, infected by the virus due to the potential dangers that um, such congregate settings pose on the well-being of those in both inside and outside of the household, including at their jobs. Um, the McKinney-Vento um, the McKinney Vento Education for Homeless Children and Youth Program and the Head Start Program both provide strategic means by which these populations can be reached and receive serve through which they can receive services. Through these programs, funding is distributed to meet the early learning, um, health, family support, and nutritional needs of homeless children and youth who have not otherwise been able to receive or benefit from such services. Meeting these persons where they are is the best way to um, eventually stabilize them and also reduce um, community spread. Um, it, through these programs, numbers, vital numbers and information on of homeless children and youth are tracked, which make it easier for these persons to receive vaccines um, should they be um, chosen as one of the populations who will be um, prioritized for early allocation. I hope that you consider adding this population or including them in further discussions of equitable allocation of, the, of a COVID-19 vaccine. And um, thank you very much for your time. Thank you. Thank you so much for bringing um, the stories of uh, the constituents to us. Uh, I think it makes a difference to hear real life stories like that. So thank you so much. Great. 
Uh, staff was informed that Gabriela Barbosa from Children's Partnership is no longer able to attend. So uh, we will move on to Shandra Crawford from the National Alliance to End Homelessness. Okay, thanks. Okay, so thank you members of the committee for allowing me to speak today on such an important topic. So my name is Sean Crawford and I'm, I'm the Director of Individual Homeless Adults at NAEH, that's the National Alliance in Homelessness. And we're nonpartisan, we're a nonprofit organization dedicated to preventing and ending homelessness. So first, let me just say up front, I'd really like to applaud the committee for prioritizing people experiencing homelessness. Um, as part of the discussion draft. And so as many of you are probably aware that people experiencing homelessness are uniquely at severe risk for contracting COVID-19 given the prevalence of risk factors in homeless populations. So first, of course, they have higher rates of chronic health needs, including respiratory disease with limited access to care. And then second, people experiencing homelessness often find it difficult to comply with public health recommendations, such as physical distancing, isolation, and quarantine because of shelter conditions and other challenges. And then let's be clear, you know, we don't even want to make the assumption that people experiencing homelessness are even able to receive the proper communication about the pandemic. That's a privilege. So People living outside or in encampments, they also live in close quarters, right? So it's just not the shelters. They share utensils and other personal items that could spread COVID-19. So of course, communities across the nation, they've taken measures to provide spaces for people experiencing homelessness to ensure social distancing. However, there's still much more work to be done and more resources are needed given the complex vulnerabilities of this population. So according to the framework, the first phase of access to the vaccine um, is slated for people of all ages with uh, comorbid and underlying conditions. So while people experiencing homelessness are explicitly mentioned during phase two, it is also really important for them to be considered for phase one as well. So for instance, cardiovascular disease is a major cause of death among people experiencing homelessness. A variety of a complex set of factors contributes to this disparities, including conditions like diabetes. So really what I wanna say is that this population fits well within the parameters defined for phase one. And it's not that that isn't obvious, I'm just really bringing forth that, that distinctions since homelessness was specifically mentioned in phase two. I just wanna make sure that we're seeing the connection there too in phase one. And it's the same with some of the older adults who fall under phase um, one who live in congregate um, settings. So as more research is becoming available about older adults experiencing homelessness, we are learning that this group actually tends to age faster than everyone else. So they have been found to experience geriatric conditions much earlier due to conditions associated with being unhoused. And so we know that over about 300,000 people over the age of 50 stayed in um, homeless shelters, representing about 23% of the entire um, shelter um, population. And even before the current health and economic crisis, the older adult homeless population was projected to trend upwards until 2030. And so even in places like Los Angeles, the 65 plus population is expected to increase by 54% over the next five years. And so given what's known about the older population experiencing homelessness who are in congregate settings and not limited to nursing homes or people being doubled up, um, they, they should most certainly be considered for phase one. Um, and so it, it's noted, I know that every older adult will be considered for phase two, regardless of whether they're experiencing homelessness, but there are distinct challenges that could place older adults experiencing homelessness um, at greater risk. And lastly, uh, what I really want to emphasize is that we know the COVID pandemic has not affected all communities the same way. And, and we touched upon this a lot during this meeting that longstanding health and social inequities have put many um, racial and ethnic minorities at increased risk for COVID-19. But I just want you to know that um, in terms of homelessness, most minority groups in the US <laughs> represent a disproportionate share of the homeless population. So the most striking disparity can be found among black, spe black people. They make up about 40% of the population 
in terms of people experiencing homelessness, but only 13% of the general populations. And so since minority groups are disproportionately impacted by homelessness and all the other challenges that go along with it and are more vulnerable um, to underlying health conditions, homeless populations should receive particular consideration so that racial inequities are not further um, exacerbated. So in closing, we understand that public health decisions can be difficult during a crisis, especially in light of limited resources. However, we encourage you to continue to consider the most vulnerable in our communities and ensure that they have access to the COVID-19 vaccine in an equitable way. Thank you. Great. Thanks so much, um, Ms. Crawford, and thanks for highlighting some of the intersections between the populations that we have uh, been discussing. So thank you very much for that. Uh, ben. Next, we have Charles Lee from the American College of Correctional Physicians. Good afternoon. I am Charles Lee. I'm a physician and president elect of the American College of Correctional Physicians, and I represent them. I would like to thank you for this opportunity to hear the voice of correctional physicians who have dedicated their lives to an underserved population, those are inmates. I have been in the field of correctional medicine for 20 years. For 10 years, I was a prison doc, and then the next 10 years, a prison auditor. I had visited nearly 200 correctional facilities all over the United States. Although I have collaborated with individuals of the American Association of Public Health Physicians and the American College of Occupational and Environmental Medicine, I do not represent them or their views. There are more than 2 million persons in correctional facilities. This is both for correctional workers and inmates. They all are in a very precarious coronavirus situation. They live and work in a setting where social distancing, access to adequate numbers of masks, and hand sanitizers are virtually impossible. They live and work in close quarters where out of necessity, there are times in which they come to very close contact with one another. Then they go home. 80 to 90% of inmates are at some time released. Correctional workers go home daily they all would be a source of spread of coronavirus in our community. There are segments of our society that have been forgotten or never thought of. They are extremely susceptible to coronavirus infection. Historically, inmates' health care has been neglected for years as a result of their socioeconomic status and living conditions. Inmates have a far greater incidence of chronic health conditions and comorbidities than those of us in the free world. We all acknowledge the susceptibility of elderly, healthcare workers, first responders, those in nursing homes, those greater than 65 with comorbidities, but we don't always acknowledge that similar susceptibility of our correctional workers and inmates. By June, over 42,000 prisoners have been infected with coronavirus. That was a rate of five times greater than the general population. Of the prisoners infected, 510 died, which is one and a half times that of the general population. As for correctional workers, it has been shown in a report by the Marshall Project of only 18 states, there were 24,000 cases of coronavirus in correctional workers. COVID-19 cases in US federal and state prisons are five and a half times higher, and the death rates three times higher than the general population. This is according to a study published in JAMA. Eight of the top 10 coronavirus hotspots in the country are in prisons. I was extremely pleased to hear just yesterday that the National Academies of Science, Engineering, and Medicine considered prisoners as a middle phase two priority. 
I would like to suggest that they also consider correctional workers, such as officers, medical care providers, and others who work inside prisons and bear the same risks. And I also hope that these often forgotten segments of our society, the correctional workers and the inmates, be similarly considered as being an increased risk by the other involved agencies, such as HHS, CDC, Operation Warp Speed, NIH, the Food and Drug Administration, and the Advisory Committee on Immunization Practices when they discuss who's at increased risk for coronavirus. And that correctional facility workers and inmates must be included. They must remain no lower than a phase two and considered a phase one for effective, safe, cost-effective, FDA-approved vaccination consideration. Again, thank you for allowing me to speak on behalf of correctional health care providers, correctional officers, and other correctional workers, and the inmates. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Dr. Lee, for your incredibly thoughtful comments. Thank you. Next, we have Karen Mountain from the Migrant Clinicians Network. Good afternoon. I'm Karen Mountain, Chief Executive Officer of the Migrant Clinicians Network. And I'm with Randy Weingarten when I say thank you, thank you, thank you for the opportunity to express our strong support for prioritizing immigrants and migrant workers and their families through enhanced vaccination programs at community health centers and for using community health workers for outreach and education. The Migrant Clinicians Network is a non-for-profit organization that creates practical solutions at the intersection of vulnerability, migration, and health. Since 1984, MCN has addressed the social determinants of health among underserved immigrant communities with an emphasis on workers, families, and children. Over the last six, 36 years, our organization has grown to serve constituents globally, providing training and technical assistance to the clinical workforce and developing culturally appropriate resources and programming. MCN has extensive experience in program design and implementation and evaluation. This experience extends to both childhood and adult vaccination programs, in particular vaccine hesitancy for annual influenza and HPV. The clinicians that we serve and support provide safety net, primary care, and widespread outreach to the most vulnerable through community health centers and other health promoting agencies. Across the US and Puerto Rico, we have engaged with community-based participatory educational outreach that serves predominantly Latinx and African-American populations who have sustained the greatest harm from COVID-19. For example, MCN partners with the Ventania de Salud programs in the 50 ge geographically dispersed Mexican consulates in the United States to connect low wage, high risk, mobile working populations with health promotion and care services. COVID-19 has made longstanding underlying health inequities into front page news as essential workers hit barrier after barrier to, safe, to get safe and to get the care they need. Much of MCN's work in 2020 has been pivoting toward perfecting these populations from COVID-19 and reducing the health inequities that the virus has really amplified. Other pathogens besides SARS-CoV-2 can cause fevers, breathing difficulties, coughs, coughs, a myriad of symptoms which can be difficult to diagnose. And these pathogens have significant impact on populations that are already experience, experiencing disparate burdens of chronic diseases. MCN recommends an enhanced coordinated vaccination program for influenza and pneumonia this fall, preceding the development of an effective vaccine for SARS-CoV-2. 
This can minimize risk against mortality from influenza and pneumococcal pneumonia. Additionally, MCN is focused on creating and bolstering the networks that mobilize within these communities when a proven safe and effective COVID-19 vaccination becomes available. Our approach will build trust and develop networks of communication and partnerships, which are designed to reach the most vulnerable. The rollout of a COVID-19 vaccine comes with lots of concerns. Generally, the most vulnerable populations who would best benefit from a functional vaccine are also the populations that have been grossly mistreated historically during vaccine trials and forced into medical procedures without their consent. We must recognize and address this tragic racist past if we are adequately to prepare the way for vaccine acceptance. We must continue our concerted efforts on outreach, but that won't be enough because we also have to address the lack of health literacy, confront the spread of health information online, and recognize how social factors influence health and begin to really address those. We must meaningfully reevaluate and rebuild the social and healthcare structures that negatively impact the health and well being of patients. And finally, and critically, health equity must be a national priority. Thank you again uh, for the fabulous work that you're doing. Um, and uh, as we, we at MCN stand ready to be a part of whatever you need from us. Thank you. Great, thank you so much for, for your very comprehensive uh, comments. Uh, you touched on a lot of points that um, are important to this committee, so thank you. Next up, we have Oluwafaranmi Okanlami from the University of Michigan. Good afternoon. Thank you for this opportunity. Since many of my colleagues have already and will continue to advocate for the special needs and specific needs of certain marginalized and vulnerable groups, urging you to consider the order in which the vaccine reaches specific communities, I will spend my time talking about and speaking more conceptually in order to make a few points. One, valid and proven methods to prove safety will be paramount in this process. While we all want a vaccine as soon as safely possible, if there is a belief that an expedited process means that shortcuts were taken, many communities will be wary of the vaccine, which could adversely impact the rate at which these communities get vaccinated. I don't imagine that I need to remind this group of the Tuskegee study carried out by the National Health Service, which withheld the known diagnosis and treatment of syphilis in the African-American men that were enrolled in the study. This is cited by some as contributing to the reasons why some African Americans are still wary of enrolling in research studies or of seeking preventive care. Next, as you continue to discuss who should get it and in what order, I would like to caution you to consider the way we speak about an individual's risk and how that plays into their priority. Members of the disabled community already fear that healthcare resources have been rationed in favor of others with lives worth saving. In light of that last point, I want to applaud what has already been an attempt to engage in a clear and effective communication strategy about what is going to be done and why. However, in order for communication to be effective, it must be accessible to and inclusive of all. While I was delighted to have this opportunity to speak today, at no point in this process was there an attempt to determine whether I had any specific access needs, such as a real-time transcription or an ASL interpreter or any other form of accommodation. In summary, we should not forget about our most marginalized and vulnerable groups as we progress through this process. However, as we do so, we must make sure that they are not the first ones we line up in order to test a vaccine that was not put through the necessary safety protocols and must communicate in a manner that educates and not one that discriminates. Finally, it was by intention that I chose to identify myself at the end because I do not believe that the words that I've shared today should be given any more or any less attention because of who I am or what I do. 
but merely because I'm a citizen of the world and the decisions that are made about how we go about this process will impact me just like they impact others. With that said, however, I'm an assistant professor of family medicine, physical medicine and rehabilitation, and urology at Michigan Medicine the Interim Director of Services for Students with Disabilities, and the Director of Adaptive Sports and Fitness within the Division of Student Life at the University of Michigan. I serve on the President's COVID-19 Campus Health Response Committee and ran our COVID-19 hotline. I'm the Disabilities Issues Representative within the Group on Diversity and Inclusion at the Association of American Medical Colleges, and I'm a member of the National Medical Association serving on the Council on Medical Legislation. Lastly, after suffering a spinal cord injury during my orthopedic surgery residency in Yale, I became paralyzed from the chest down and now fall into what I call the multiply, multiply marginalized status as being a disabled black man living in America. Once again, thank you for the opportunity to share these words and thank you for all the wonderful work that you were doing to ensure the equitable distribution of this vaccine. Thank you very much uh, for that. Um... Dr. Dr. Okunlami, and um, thanks so much for sharing your personal experiences as well. I think we all recognize how important it is that as uh, you spoke as an individual, you were able to also frame it in the different ways in which you have experienced these issues that we're talking about. So thank you very much. Great. Uh, next up, we have Amy Pisani from Vaccinate Your Family. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. So good afternoon. My name is Amy Tisani, and I serve as the Executive Director of Vaccinate Your Family. Um, I really thank you for the opportunity to comment today. This National Academies Committee has taken on a tremendously important and very delicate issue of allocating future vaccines equitably. And the initial framework is moving in the right direction, particularly as it builds from past experience and existing distribution systems. Vaccinate Your Family, which is formerly known as Every Child by Two, as Dr. Fagy knows, is a national nonprofit organization committed to protecting people of all ages from vaccine preventable diseases. And for nearly 30 years, our organization has been at the forefront of efforts to educate the public about the critical importance of timely vaccinations and to increase confidence in the safety and efficacy of vaccines. Our organization has helped to shape policies that have made lasting improvements to the vaccine infrastructure of this nation and we will continue to work with our partners to support the systemic changes to improve the vaccination rates of children and adults who are the ones who are experiencing the greatest disparities in coverage right now. So while protecting everyone against COVID-19 with a vaccine will not be possible in the immediate future, we are all very hopeful that SARS-CoV-2 will soon be on the list of viruses against which the world is protected through life-saving vaccines. Vaccinate Your Family is immensely grateful for the thoughtful draft distribution framework created by this committee, and we support the principle of equal regard for all individuals. Our organization, and me personally as a Rotarian, urge the nation to extend this to include the prioritization of high-risk health workers throughout the globe. As the world is now aware, COVID-19 has disproportionately impacted adults over the age of 65, people of all ages with underlying health conditions, and the economically disadvantaged. The same populations who have had severe outcomes from COVID-19, including those who suffer from diabetes, heart disease, and a variety of lung conditions are also at higher risk from other infectious diseases for which we have vaccines, including influenza, pneumonia, shingles, and whooping cough. And we agree with the committee's view that the fundamental inequities in COVID-19 and in other health conditions are rooted in structural inequalities, racism, and residential segregation. While there have been devastating consequences from this pandemic, it's our hope that the public's awareness of the dangers of certain underlying medical, medical conditions will drive the development of new partnerships between public health and community organizations, patient advocacy groups, and specialized health associations, many of whom actually commented here today, all in an effort to increase awareness of the critical importance of eliminating vaccination disparities. We urge policymakers to review the background information in this report and take immediate steps to overcome the challenges faced by adults who do not have full coverage for vaccinations under their health plans, Medicaid or Medicare. And we support the committee's draft recommendation to develop an emergency infrastructure program for adults based on the remarkable successes of the Vaccines for Children program, which was created in 1993 and has been credited with nearly eliminating racial vaccine disparities among children. 
In order to increase public confidence in the prioritization plan, we wish to stress the importance of making the decisions of this committee readily accessible to the public. We appreciate that the committee recognizes the, the need to ensure the framework is easily understood by all audiences and that the vaccine is not only distributed equitably, but also perceived as equitable by populations who are socioeconomically, culturally, and educationally diverse and who have a distinct historical experiences with the health system, some which may not have been positive. Therefore, we urge the National Academies and the government agencies to engage traditional and non-traditional vaccine partners now to, to share your final recommendations with the media online and through organizations with direct access to the public. People in the U.S. must understand the process for developing your framework as well as the framework itself in order to feel confident that the new vaccines will be distributed fairly and equitably. Now, unfortunately, some people who will be prioritized for COVID-19 vaccines, they may be hesitant about the vaccine safety and efficacy. And so efforts to communicate about this framework must therefore be complemented with an ongoing conversation about the amazing systems that we have in place to monitor vaccine safety and efficacy in the US. The purpose and historical success of these safety systems should be broadly shared with the public regularly. The considerations set forth in this report reflect the committee's vast scientific and social justice expertise. And we appreciate the careful deliberation of the critical factors that will ensure equitable distribution that will help mitigate the spread of COVID-19. And as we await the committee's final report, Vaccinate Your Families staff and board will focus our efforts on ensuring that every individual who seeks a future vaccine has equal access to immunizations. Thank you very much for everything that you're doing. Thank you. Thanks for your comments and uh, they will be very useful for our deliberations on what we have already um, uh, issued in the, the, the uh, report, but also for some of the chapters that are coming later, particularly around communication. So thank you very much. Um, we will now move to our last uh, panel and um, it will be our, our last public comment panel that has uh, already registered. We do have an additional, we do have additional time afterwards for people who have not registered, but um, let's start with this panel, and I'll turn it over to you, Ben. Great. Uh, to start this panel, we have Georges Benjamin from the American Public Health Association. Hi, everyone. Um, let me thank you very much for, for allowing me to speak. Um, I'm Dr. Gail, Dr. Fagy, um, and members of the committee. Um, this, is, this, is a, this is a good piece of work, and let me just thank you very much for, for what you've done so far. I, I, I strongly believe that the principles are sound that the phase approach that you've taken um, is the right approach. I think there's some clarity needed um, for some of the people in, in multiple, that could be in multiple phases. And what I mean by that is, for example, um, if you have high comorbidities and you're homeless, um, you know, folk, folks are gonna look at each one of those categories and figure out which bucket they need to be in. Um, and I think you just need to, we need to make that clear so that people understand uh, which bucket are they in? Otherwise, you'll have enormous confusion. Same thing is, for example, high comorbidities if you're a teacher. Um, I, I think that's going to be a, another way to think about that. There, there are certainly some critical infrastructure jobs um, that um, have to be covered. Um, you know, obviously, if you're in the military and you're on a submarine, um, you're probably going to need to be vaccinated. Um, if you're in a nuclear power plant, and there may be a, a couple other uh, critical infrastructures that you might want to consider moving up into that first phase because without them, um, they become single points of failure uh, as the nation tries to recover. Um, I, I also recognize that your phase one and phase two actually may get blended in real time when you actually try to try to implement this thing in the real world. I, I would like to see um, the term cultural competency used more uh, in the draft. Um, you certainly talk about equity uh, throughout, but I think that would be something that would strengthen that. Um, and then uh, two final things. Number one, I, I'm very much concerned about our nation um, participating in vaccine nationalism. Um, and this is not a political statement. This is something I believe very strongly that unless we join the global effort, then all of our efforts will be at naught. 
Um, and secondly, um, I believe it's going to be very, very important that starting right away, um, that we promote a unified national voice on this vaccine with no deviations. Our, our risk of having people be totally confused about the safety and efficacy of this vaccine, particularly in light of the anti-vaccine movement, particularly in light of a political season. I know you've tried very hard to avoid the politics in this through several of the statements you've made in the document, but I do believe that importance of a national unified voice on this is more important than ever. And with that, I'll thank you. APHA will be course sitting more detailed written comments uh, through the process as well. Thank you. Thank you very much, Dr. Benjamin. And thanks for those very practical uh, comments. And um, we will, uh, of course, take them um, seriously and into consideration. Next, we have Paul Conway from the American Association of Kidney Patients. Uh, thank you very much for uh, allowing me to uh, give comment today. Um, as a kidney patient myself, I've managed kidney disease for 40 years, three years on dialysis, the past 23 years as a kidney transplant patient, and uh, I also have five heart stents. So many of the things that are in the report uh, resonate not just with me, but also in my role as Chair of Policy and Global Affairs for the American Association of Kidney Patients and as a board member of the Kidney Health Initiative. AAKP is the largest independent kidney patient organization in the United States. Right now in the United States, you have 37 million Americans that have kidney disease. And of those, half, more than half a million are on dialysis, 100,000 are waiting for kidney transplant, and you have tens of thousands who have kidney transplants like myself who are immunocompromised. Across that population, it's extremely diverse. And unfortunately, it's overrepresented in the minority communities among African American, Hispanic, Latino, Native American, Asian Island, Pacific, uh, they have a disproportionate uh, negative impact with kidney disease. And within those populations, also when you look at kidney disease, you have many cofactors, including heart disease, hypertension, anemia, many of the other cofactors that are listed. I was pleased to see in the 114 pages of the report, there are two references to kidney disease and they parallel exactly uh, the priorities listed by the CDC uh, for kidney patients being high risk. One of the things that I wanted to point out today are two very strong headwinds that I think that the Academy needs to be aware of for the kidney population. One is historic. And chiefly what that is, is there has been a um, tendency to ignore and not include kidney patients in clinical trials, uh, historically. Our organization, which has been in existence for 50 years, has worked quite closely uh, with the pharmaceutical industry and with researchers to change that. And more importantly, the Kidney Health Initiative, uh, which is a partnership between the American Society of Nephrology and the FDA, uh, worked quite strongly since March and issued an actual policy statement in May calling upon uh, clinicians and researchers to include chronic kidney disease and kidney failure patients in clinical trials for COVID-19 vaccines. I'm pleased to see that Moderna and also uh, Pfizer have included kidney patients in their trials. Right now, there are three phase three trials. Two of those do include uh, kidney patients. Kidney transplant patients are not included because of obvious concerns about immunocompromise and vaccine, but the Kidney Health Initiative is engaged with them and working with those communities and the transplant professionals, uh, and we will be doing that on an ongoing basis. The other headwind that I wanted to put on the table here that you need to be aware of is more modern. Uh, in fact, just in the past six months, in the past six months, the kidney population and particularly kidney dialysis patients have seen a tremendous number of news reports that indicate that kidney patients are not being included in emergency protocols in hospitals and in uh, many of the care delivery systems in the event of a surge or an overwhelming number. This is despite the fact that many kidney patients have advanced directives that say, keep me alive. This became such an issue in the spring that three major stakeholders, the American Association of Kidney Patients, the American Society of Nephrology, and the Renal Physicians uh, Association went to HHS and the HHS Office of Civil Rights. And the Office of Civil Rights issued very, very strong, unambiguous guidance to all healthcare providers in the United States that kidney patients on the American, under the Americans for Disabilities Act have the same protections and rights intact, regardless of the crisis. 
And the reason why I raise that is because the level of distrust that was raised by healthcare systems, not all of them, but some of them, and some healthcare providers is still echoing in the kidney community. Based on our survey data, which is rather robust, in March, 83% of kidney patients indicated they feared COVID-19 contracting it. By our tracking surveys in June, that number had gone above 95%. So while patients are very aware of the fact that they're at risk, there's a high level of distrust also in terms of how they will actually be treated. And to echo some of the comments here, some of those are cultural and historic, going right back to Tuskegee, but also a lot of kidney patients understand that for the processes they go through, many of those drugs and procedures that they do did not involve patients at the start. So within the stakeholder community, we're trying to address that, keep confidence, keep transparency, and educate people that a vaccine is coming. But when the guidance is issued, I'd strongly encourage active engagement with the medical professional societies, the Kidney Health Initiative, our organization, and many other patient organizations to make certain that our capacities for communication are ready to go, but that you've done due diligence in making certain that it is 100% transparent, the prioritization of patients, because as a community, uh, historically, and especially among our minority populations within the kidney community, they felt as though their voice was not included in many of the medical solutions that they essentially have no choice in taking. Or Mr. In Conway, your, your time is up, if you can wrap up. Sure thing. So again, uh, I thank you very much. Uh, I've served under four presidents and three governors, including as the chief of staff for the U.S. Department of Labor. This is a health and workforce issue, and we appreciate the work that you do, and we stand ready to assist. Thank you. Thank you very much, and thanks for giving us some nuance uh, to the issues with kidney patients that we might not have known otherwise. So thank you very much. Next, we have Nicole Cruz from California State University, East Bay. Thank you for providing me the opportunity to speak today. My name is Nicole Cruz, and I am a nursing student at the California State University of East Bay, currently in my community health practice course. I am in favor of first vaccinating the populations that have been hit hardest by COVID-19 and are at increased risk for exposing others, but it's more important to look upstream at the factors that put many people at greater risk for hospitalization and death from COVID-19 in the first place. Racial and ethnic minorities are more at risk of having underlying health conditions, lack of access to quality health care, inadequate health insurance coverage, crowded living conditions, low income or low wage jobs, lack of educational opportunities, inability to quarantine or work remotely, and being an essential worker. These factors can offer less opportunity for social distancing as well. Race by itself is not a risk factor for COVID, but lack of access to quality health care causes people to develop untreated medical conditions. This derives from inadequate health insurance coverage because people can't afford the cost of uncovered care. The CDC states that the risk for hospitalization is three times more likely for people who have hypertension compared to someone without this condition. Their data has also shown that racial and ethnic minority groups with the reference conditions such as obesity, asthma, and type 2 diabetes are at an even higher risk for severe COVID illness. We know that compared to white persons, American Indian or Alaska Native, African American and Hispanic persons have higher cases and hospitalizations due to COVID-19 there is a greater risk of exposure leading to greater risk of disease, which specifically affects people of color. Likewise, frontline healthcare workers are very important in stemming the pandemic and preventing death and severe illness. From the beginning of the pandemic, many frontline workers have worked in environments where they have been exposed to the virus, often without adequate PPE. I had to leave my clinical site for my second medical surgical rotation at a hospital in Berkeley, California in March due to COVID-19. I remember hearing the nurses saying that they were going to raise their concerns regarding lack of PPE and information to infection control. The nurse I was shadowing that day had a rule out COVID-19 patient to care for and she knew that she did not have the appropriate personal protective equipment because she was only given a surgical mask and gown. She told the other nurses that the hospital was more prepared in giving its nurses PPE during the Ebola outbreak. Without a doubt, healthcare workers are critical to providing essential care, especially to older adults who are at greater risk of COVID-19 disease. They are also able to provide multilingual guidance and education to racial and ethnic minority groups regarding the virus. 
Vaccinating these individuals <clears throat> not only enables them to provide these services, but also reduces the risk that they will spread the infection as they work in hospitals, nursing homes, assisted living facilities, home care and group homes, or return to their own homes. As stated in the draft on page 54, line 1177, frontline healthcare workers were recommended to be in the first phase to receive the vaccine based on their risk factor. All in all, priority access to a vaccine should also be based on risk factors such as occupation, susceptibility to disease, age, and income. Vaccines should be given for free and for all, especially in adequate quantities to areas of high social vulnerability and delivered at locations accessible to racial and ethnic minority populations living in those areas. Thank you again to the committee for the opportunity to speak and for the draft. Great, thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Anna Legrad Dopp from the American Society of Health System Pharmacists. Good afternoon. My name is Anna Legrad Dopp. I'm the Senior Director of Clinical Guidelines and Quality Improvement at the American Society of Health System Pharmacists, or ASHP, located in Bethesda, Maryland. Thank you, National Academies, committee members, and dedicated committee staff for the opportunity to react to the recently released preliminary framework for equitable allocation of the COVID-19 vaccine. Your efforts to ensure the final report is balanced, objective, inclusive, dynamic, and feasible is no easy task given all the uncertainty in the months ahead. ASHP is the collective voice of pharmacists who serve as patient care providers in hospitals, health systems, ambulatory clinics, and other healthcare settings spanning the full spectrum of medication use. Our organization's nearly 55,000 members include pharmacists, pharmacy technicians, and student pharmacists. ASHP members are at the forefront of efforts to improve medication use and enhance patient safety and this includes the safe and effective use of vaccines. Our comments aim to supplement and amplify earlier remarks given by Dr. Scott Knorr with the American Pharmacists Association and Dr. Chad Wurz with the American Society of Consultant Pharmacists. Our comments are centered around equitable allocation and strategic distribu distribution of the vaccine against the SARS-CoV-2. This is a highly anticipated and critical countermeasure to the COVID-19 global pandemic. In particular, we want to bring to your attention the role that pharmacists play on the front lines of providing patient care to COVID-19 patients. ASHP members provide direct patient care on interprofessional teams such as infectious disease teams in hospitals, emergency departments, and critical care units, including caring for those patients that may require mechanical ventilation. Pharmacists also provide direct patient care in ambulatory and community settings addressing the chronic care needs in the high-risk patient populations that have been discussed earlier and providing testing for COVID-19 across all 50 states as authorized by the Department of Health and Human Services under the PrEP Act. All frontline healthcare workers, including pharmacists and pharmacy technicians, need to be included in the first phase of vaccination efforts. We specifically request that the committee include pharmacists in Tier 1 as a high-priority group group high priority target group that meets important societal needs. This is one of many crucial conversations around strategic planning for the COVID-19 vaccine that needs to take place. As the committee continues to work on the remaining aspects of the report, we'd like to share for your consideration some principles that ASHP released recently related to COVID-19 vaccine development, distribution, allocation, administration, monitoring, and surveillance. Our principles aim to bridge lessons learned from previous max vac vaccination efforts, current experience with the COVID-19 pandemic, and best practices in effective pandemic preparedness, supply chain management, and clinical practice. In addition, they emphasize that pharmacists and pharmacy technicians have a deep understanding of how to optimize vaccine supply and use. Many of our principles overlap with considerations that this committee is discussing, so we will submit them in our comments. They range from collaboration and coordination, both domestically and internationally, to ensure ethical and equitable global distribution of, of the vaccine, to remaining vigilant with continued research and comprehensive surveillance. This truly is the largest single vaccination effort the global health community has experienced. 
It is imperative that COVID-19 vaccines are distributed in an ethical, equitable, and efficient manner to maximi maximize population protection from SARS-CoV-2. In addition, extraordinary efforts will be required to empower, mobilize, and protect our immunizing workforce, including pharmacists. In summary, thank you for your dedication to guide these critical vaccine application decisions to ensure they are equitable and prioritized for greatest public health impact. The profession of pharmacy and ASAP stands ready to collaborate and support. Thank you. Great. Thank you. Thank you so much. And we look forward to getting um, your total written comments, including the principles that you alluded to. Uh, I think that'll be very helpful for our deliberations as well. So thank you. Next, we have Ann Kimball. One has to unmute to be heard. Uh, thank you very much for the opportunity. I've been watching some parts of these comments and wow, they are very rich. But congratulations on a really strong piece of work. Uh, I'll probably be you know, kind of singing to the choir here, but um, I've been working largely uh, with my own community here in Kitsap County, with my county health officers, with my Rotary Club and others working on masking and other initiatives to prevent COVID. I also have 40 years of experience working internationally on pandemics and epidemics, which has also been helpful uh, in my local work. I'd like to uh, just comment on three aspects of your report. One is uh, transmission risk inclusion, two is political context, and three is global cooperation, all of which you've addressed in the report. And by the way, I really want to congratulate you on this report. It's a very comprehensive and clear document. Transmission risk as a core value, I think would enhance your discussion of reducing morbidity and mortality. Uh, I was a little confused uh, uh, on line 746 when you began to talk about uh, the, the, the two different options of looking at morbidity and mortality as maximum benefit versus transmission risk reduction. And in my experience in working with local health departments, as much metrics as can be included about transmission risk rationale, it really helps them. They're desperate for sort of signposts of when do I do this, when do I do that, and being able to explain it to their communities. So I would just suggest that as we understand more about transmission risk, which we are definitely beginning to do from the literature, I think including that aspect a little more prominently in your argument at the front end of uh, framing your arguments uh, would probably be helpful. I think uh, your report says on line uh, 1086 that you would like to avoid political context in your remarks and I sure appreciate how much that would be a wonderful thing. <laughs> but I would like to emphasize that as you all know, political leadership is absolutely critical in how this rollout occurs. And I think other speakers have spoken to the need for solidarity of messaging, and you're all aware of that. But I'd like to bring some perspective from my community work, uh, because I don't think we all appreciate just how far misinformation campaigns have reached into populations, be they blue populations or red populations, on vaccine hesitancy and mask refusal. It's been very, very impressive to me as a Rotarian working across Rotary Clubs on a number of projects that even the most educated people are listening to some of the messaging that's coming forward about how masks can be dangerous, et cetera. So vaccine hesitancy, which is treated in the report to some extent, I think digging into some of the current work that's going on uh, about vaccine rumors and how they travel in communities will be very helpful in assuring smooth vaccine rollout. And in terms of political leadership, no matter who is at the top of the pyramid when this rolls out, we honestly need to see our leader and his family or her family, you know, having the vaccine publicly and demonstrating because we all know that people watch as much as they listen and providing those examples will be critically important from the top. 
from the community level, your report talks about financial barriers in exploring this with the CDC guidance that just came out and the state and local planning that's going on. The planning suggests there could be a charge when people present at the pharmacy and the uninsured, although mentioned in your report, I think after we spent $8 billion on getting a vaccine, your average American expects it to be free. Now that may not be realistic, but I will also submit that we could do a lot better with the uninsured since fully a third of Americans don't have access to healthcare at this point in our country. It'll be critically important to remove all financial obstacles as well as creating solidarity of messaging and getting political leadership. Finally, I wanted to address just briefly a topic close to my heart and to all of your heart, which is global cooperation. And I would definitely emphasize what George Benjamin uh, told you just a few minutes ago, and you all understand, as we've heard that the COVAX facility for assuring equitable access across the world to this vaccine effort, uh, the United States has decided not to be at that table. Uh, we really have vacated our leadership internationally, and I think we are going to feel uh, some of the consequences of that not only in a loss of leadership for the United States, but our own people will suffer from the inter lack of interchange of information and collaboration around the globe. And I think it's critically important that as we look at your framework that that in the report could be called out. Uh, you do mention it on lines 492 and 493, but now that we've learned this new information, you may well want to, um, to emphasize, as we learned, you know, as we've learned through every single pandemic and- I'm sorry to interrupt, but your time is up, if you can wrap up. Okay. And, and I would just, uh, thank you, thank important. you very much, uh, Dr. Kim, for those comments. Um, make sure you realize that the global considerations, as well as the implementation, were not in the draft that were released. Those are in chapters to come. So they weren't as fully covered, but those issues will be more fully covered in uh, the rest of the report that has not yet been issued as a draft. So thank you. Next, we have Harald Schmidt from the University of Pennsylvania. Um, hello, my name is Harold Schmidt. I'm an assistant professor of medical ethics and health policy at the Perlman School of Medicine at the University of Pennsylvania, a research associate at the Center for Health and Centers and Behavioral Economics and a senior scholar at Penn's Lund David Institute of Health Economics. The focus of my research as a bioethicist is on resource allocation and personal responsibility for health, and that's the perspective I'm uh, providing here. So I'd like to start by thanking you for the opportunity to share some thoughts, and also by congratulating the committee uh, chairs, the members, and the staffers for the way in which social justice considerations have been incorporated in the current framework. Uh, you have a nice review of existing frameworks, and it's clear that the proposed framework quite seamlessly builds on these. But importantly, it also lays the groundwork to counter a clear trend in dominant allocation frameworks that are mostly utilitarian and address social justice at best peripherally, if at all. So my view, there's considerable value in conceptualizing equity as a cross-cutting consideration, as the committee proposes and in demonstrating both the need and the feasibility of using measures of deprivation to improve fairness in allocating vaccines. Now, some of the committee members and staffers know I made a similar argument in an essay published in the Hastings Center report in May, in which I drew in a different but closely related measure of deprivation, the error deprivation index, to suggest that it should be used for prioritizing worse off groups among the general population on economic, epidemiological, and ethical grounds. Doing that is imperative for social justice now, and especially also in view of the longer term impacts and the damage and pain that would result if, in particular, worse off African American communities find themselves at the back of the line for a safe and effective vaccine. Uh, that would be an immense damage and pain. So while I could really not be more sympathetic towards the approach, I'm also aware of some unique challenges that come with it, and I want to share three here. And these are to do with how exactly the prioritization works. What, if anything, we owe to prioritize groups to receive a vaccine that is inferior to a later one, and how we should think about uh, a framework for allocation, not just within, but across states. So first on how to prioritize by disadvantage. 
Uh, the committee writes, within the population groups included in each of these four phases, the committee recommends that vaccine access should be prioritized for geographic areas identified as vulnerable through CDC's social vulnerability index. But so the question is, would prioritizing by the index mean giving all vaccines to the worst off decile, let's say, in each of the groups in each phase and none to the others? Or should we select a random subset and each of the deciles within a phase, but say give disproportionately more to several of the worst off deciles, right? So the uh, index can provide a helpful measure of disadvantage, but it also requires an external normative yardstick for guiding actual allocation. So we need clarity on how the weights or ratios are constructed. In my view, a pragmatic and ethically meaningful standard would be to allocate within uh, the subgroups of a phase by the relative COVID-related impact that the group experienced, which can be operationalized with existing data. Second, on the point of whether there might be special obligations towards those who are prioritized. One of the ways in which the current pandemic is unique is that an allocation framework needs to work not only for delivering one type of vaccine, but in all likelihood for several ones. And these may differ in effectiveness, safety, or cost. So if it turns out that the, the initially prioritized populations receive a vaccine that is inferior in some way, do we just accept that as such, or is there something that we owe them? And it seems to me that clarity about any such arrangements would likely also be of relevance for addressing vaccine hesitancy that came up a couple of times. And take it takes on even more importance in light of the uh, public concerns and also concerns that were made today about perceptions of the vaccine being rushed uh, for political or other reasons. And then third, on the issue of how to think about allocating other than directly to people. For the framework that the committee has outlined to work, there needs to be clarity about what numbers of doses each state receives at different points in time. Uh, many of the same considerations apply here. And personally, it would make a lot of sense for me to urge that the highest level allocations formula also take into consideration the respective states' levels of deprivation. So maybe addressing such questions will come under the implementation part that I understand is separate, but in any case, simply to say that Addressing this aspect will likely add clarity, uh, avoid what many have rightly called a chaotic way of distributing Redemsevere, and seems to be within the remit of the committee overall. So again, my congratulations on the work so far, and I hope that you'll agree that the final report will be even more helpful if it clarifies the weight for prioritizing across groups, if it addresses issues to do with multiple vaccines, and comments on the rationales that should guide allocations across state. And one final thought in the few seconds I have remaining, which is that in an early comment today, Dr. Ophelia noted that she was concerned whether the vulnerability index sufficiently captured COVID's impact on black communities. And given the central role of the index, it would seem useful to comment on the differential utility of different types of indices too. Thank you very much. Great, thank you very much for those very thoughtful questions. All right, last we have Lily Schwartz from Body Politic. Hi, yes, everyone, thank you. Um, my name is Lindley Swartz. I help run an online support group for COVID-19 patients uh, through the organization Potty Politic. So first of all, I wanna thank you everyone for selecting me to join in the discussion. I think the value of public input cannot be understated when we're determining allocation of a COVID-19 vaccine. I'm coming here today to present the experience of a COVID-19 long hauler in an effort to better inform the committee how and why vulnerable populations should receive equitable access. I hope that everyone here is familiar with the term long hauler that I just used, and you have at least some others, some understanding of what it means. There have been more articles documenting the experience recently, but many people still do not know about this group. For tens of thousands of people, it's been a lived experience for months. The term long hauler here defines the group of people who became sick with COVID-19, who had symptoms that may not have been severe enough to warrant hospitalization, but who also did not recover in two to four weeks. These people have been suffering with ongoing symptoms for weeks and months. I myself became ill in mid-April with chest tightness and heart palpitations, but my PCP was dismissive on the phone, and at the time I could not receive access to a test. Uh, my symptoms continued to expand and persist for weeks. Um, when I could finally get a call back, um, the PCP continued to be dismissive. Finally, I was able to get a PCR test seven weeks after my initial symptoms started and an antibody test at nine weeks at the guidance of a new doctor. Both results came back negative. It's now been nearly five months and I'm still symptomatic. 
Um, at this point, I want to pause here and name a few of the symptoms that I've been battling for five months as I think it's really important. Heart palpitations, chest tightness, food intolerance, alcohol intolerance, headaches, nausea, heartburn, sore throat, fever, altered sense of smell and taste, shortness of breath, phantom smells, muscle aches, heat and humidity intolerance, and O2 level drops with activity. The most severe and ongoing have been debilitating fatigue and brain fog. The fatigue for me was so debilitating that I was nearly bed bound for eight weeks. I still require naps and loads of rest each day just to function. The brain fog gets worse as I get tired. I battle with short-term memory loss, lags in critical thinking, and communication challenges. With healthcare providers denying me access to services related to COVID-19 recovery and dismissiveness of my persistent symptoms, I've been mostly on my own to recover. Thankfully, after five months, I am nearly functional and nearly recovered. The completeness of my recovery so far has no doubt occurred because of my privilege. I am a fortunate person. I have stable income through a job which provides health insurance, allows me to work from home, and supported me during the peak of my illness. I own my own home, so I didn't have to worry about keeping a roof over my head. I had supportive family, friends, and a significant other who not only helped me, but they believed me. I was also fortunate enough to find the online support group that I referenced earlier who let me know that I wasn't alone. Um, to date, Body Politics COVID-19 support group has had over 16,000 requests to join from around the world, many of whom are also long callers. I talk about this because as, an, as was outlined in the committee's discussion draft, who is in the vulnerable population should not solely be reliant upon socioeconomic status. The committee must evaluate what types of populations are at most risk if they potentially become long haulers. I know that we don't know the answers yet about who becomes a long hauler and why, but it's something to consider for this committee. Individuals who don't have health um, insurance, who can't afford to miss more than two weeks of work, who can't access support resources because they don't have in-home internet connection, and others um, are very valid reasons to consider. Many of these individuals who work in certain industries could be at risk of losing their job, housing, and other basic human rights if they were to become a long hauler. I urge the committee to consider these individuals as part of their vulnerable population when considering phase one and phase two. I have then a few recommendations to the committee when partnering with state and local authorities in regards to this vulnerable population. Make vaccines available in the same location as PCR tests and antibody tests to lessen confusion. Make the vaccines available in pharmacies. Many individuals in all types of geographic, geographic locations have access to a pharmacy within a few uh, miles of their home. Access should be along public transit routes. Access should in no way be related to previous PCR and antibody tests. Encourage partnerships with local neighborhood organizations so that information can be disseminated in a non-internet manner. Thank you, everyone. Thank you very much and thank you for sharing your personal experience and I think giving us you know, more insight to um, what many people are actually experiencing. Uh, so with that, that, that closes our um, scheduled panels, but we would like to um, open it up for about 20 minutes or so um, for general public to provide comments. Um, you see there the uh, instructions, um, use your raise your hand feature on the webinar or nine, a star nine if you have a, if you're using a regular phone, that will let the staff know that you're um, interested in making a comment and you will be unmuted. Um, everyone has exactly three minutes or less um, to make their comments so we can get as many comments in as possible. Um, so, and, and of course, remember the rules of conduct that we talked about previously in terms of uh, using uh, uh, public decorum uh, effectively. So thank you very much. And we will open it up for any members of the general public who would like to make a brief comment. Okay, the first hand that I saw was Robert Steinglass. Go ahead, please feel free yes, to start. Uh, thank you very much for a great presentation and, a, and also a great um, job on explaining the what and the why in the um, draft um, document. Um, I 
feel that um, it focuses much less on so many operational issues related to how. And it wasn't clear to me actually until this public listening session that there are still plans to draft further guidance on operationalizing the framework, you know, regarding community engagement, risk communications, vaccine, vaccine hesitancy, which I sometimes refer to as vaccination hesitancy, not quite the same thing, and global issues. Um, so in fact, when I did submit some of my public comments and I had to choose a label for them, I was frustrated because there was no choice, in fact, for labeling them as operationalizing the framework in practice. So I'm glad to know that there's still a plan to have those chapters. Just as an example, can you imagine in practice under conditions of vaccine scarcity and also given the local power dynamics, the frontline healthcare worker is going to be under enormous pressure if in fact they are expected to decide and on their own and verify whether the individual standing in front of them truly qualifies for vaccination based on any designated higher risk category. So how is that going to be addressed? Hopefully the chapter will deal with that. Um, also, just one last example. There are so many, but just one last one. How will the allocation of scarce vaccine supplies be locally determined across different sites, private practices, public clinics, pharmacies, outreach to migrant communities, for example, while in fact retaining overall public trust that the system is rolling out fairly without favoritism, without leakage of vaccine to lower risk and more powerful individuals. So those are just two examples of what I mean by operationalizing uh, the framework. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, the next person is Theo Allen, and I'm just going to ask that when you uh, have a chance to speak, just unraise your hand so that we know who's next in the queue. And we can probably take this down. So, what I heard today from everyone speaking was that the national science, engineering, and medicine is really focused on prioritizing healthcare workers when we know that the people with comorbidities who live in congregate settings like nursing homes, healthcare, long-term work, as well as any other place where people just live in overcrowded housing makes a difference. In addition, healthcare workers in New York did not experience any increased risk of transmission. Antibody rates were actually 12.2% compared to nearly 20% for the general population. Unless you're going to consider who's at severe risk, which means prioritizing the people who have comorbidities, who are elderly, particularly minorities, you can't actually effectively distribute a vaccine targeting the most vulnerable and saving the most lives. Finally, we need to focus on PPE, particularly respirators and masks, because until we can get everyone vaccinated, we still need mitigation. So thank you. Thank you, Mr. Allen. All right, the next name on our list is, uh, I'm sorry if I don't pronounce your name right, Shamir Smith. Hello, everybody. Um, it's it's, it's a pleasure to be with you. Um, I'm honored to have this opportunity to talk to you. Um, I am scheduled tomorrow, um, as a matter of fact, and ironically, for a cataract surgery. Um, I'm 38 years old. I'm a Black woman, as you can see, and I'm a teacher in Baltimore City. And this virus has robbed me of my vision and my left eye. I have not been able to see since April of this year. Not only that, but I have developed trigeminal neuralgia and occipital neuralgia. I am living in a city with one of the most prominent hospitals in the world. And I have been told that because I tested negative for this virus, that I do not qualify for any vaccination trials or opportunities. I am what you call a long hauler. I would, I believe 
that black women and Latino women should be, as, as many of you all have, have, have said in this conversation, which has been a dynamic conversation, we cannot exclude um, those demographics of women because of negative testing. We need to be included in those conversations as it relates to vaccination. Um, because we understand also that Black women and Latino women who are pregnant are also at a higher risk, we cannot afford to exclude those women out of the conversation and those people out of the conversation. Baltimore City is, a, is becoming more of a hot spot for the virus once again, and I believe that we need to make sure that we concentrate on the negative people who have tested negative that we presume positive and not exclude those people as well. So we do need to give further consideration for that. I'm honored to be able to have spoken with you. Thank you. Thank you very much. Next, we have Matthew Ellenwood. Matthew, are you able to speak? We could go to the next. Oh, yeah. Yes. Can you hear me now? Yes, yes, we can. My name is Matthew Ellenwood. I am a comparative medical geneticist, and I am the chief scientific officer at the National MPS Society. Our society represents a group of serious, rare genetic disorders uh, affecting mostly pediatric patients, involving severe cardiovascular, respiratory, orthopedic, and cognitive uh, diseases. Our patients are members of vulnerable communities in multiple ways. However, the knowledge of these disorders is quite variable, both at the federal, state, and even local healthcare uh, uh, provider level. Some designation of individuals with rare diseases as phase 1B vaccine recipients could be extremely useful to aid in the uh, uh, vaccination of this vulnerable community who are also guaranteed to be encountering the medical community and thus potentially vectoring disease uh, uh, to strategically vulnerable populations. Listing them explicitly and also appendixes that may contain specific disease syndrome listings could help advocates who may be approaching state or county medical providers uh, at, to assure that they are considered as vulnerable populations. Thank you for an extraordinarily uh, well done draft and a very good conversation. Uh, I've appreciated greatly its inclusivity. Thank you. Great, thank you so much. Next we have uh, Sharon and Nui. Yes, hi, thank you so much for the report and the session today. Um, I'm a National Academy member, I'm a geriatrician and a professor at Harvard Medical School. And I wanted to ask or um, make sure that the report might stress about the importance of older adults and other vulnerable groups, including the disabled and diverse populations that we've been talking about in COVID uh, vaccine trials. Um, many of the ones that have been published so far and also from a review of clinicaltrials.gov, um, the, um, these populations will often be excluded from these trials, which is really concerning because we won't know, you know about the effectiveness and whether there need to be dosage adjustments or double doses as are needed with some vaccines. Um, in these populations, and we may also not know about side effects. And I'm also concerned, um, in addition, because funders and um, organizations may utilize the lack of vaccine testing as a reason to avoid equitable distribution, saying that it hasn't been tested yet in these populations and it might not be safe. So I'm hoping that uh, part of the report can mention and focus on this really important aspect as well. Thank you. Next we have Leslie Grant. 
Thank you. Uh, my name is Leslie Grant. I'm a general dentist in the Baltimore area and a speech language pathologist. I'd like to state that I'm speaking as an individual and not representing or on behalf of any organization. However, I'd like to acknowledge that I am a past president of the National Dental Association. I want to thank you for this extraordinary forum um, to express our concerns regarding equitable vaccine allocation once COVID vaccine becomes available. Each of the testimonies today have been compelling. I'd just like to add to the earlier comments of Dr. O'Loughlin from the American Dental Association. Dental practitioners offer a great safety net for providing vaccinations. We are amongst the most trusted of healthcare providers and are well known for our historical and continuing focus on prevention. General dentists typically treat the entire family and often multiple generations within one family. Because of the frequency of dental visits, our relationships with our patients are solidly established. We are experts, experts in injection administration safety and offer care environments where treatment is delivered by providers who have long-term familiarity and implementation of infection control protocols, aerosol safety, and proper sequence for donning and removal of personal protective equipment. We provide care to children who receive Medicaid benefits. We provide care in correctional facilities, school-based health programs, nursing homes, and community health centers. Our reach is broad, skilled, and impactful. Dentists will be your phenomenal partner in reaching an expanded demographic of patients requiring vaccinations. We're often excluded from this arena, unfortunately, and we hope to be included as an integral component of the equitable vaccine allocation and administration. Thank you again for this tremendous opportunity. Thank you for all of your hard work. Thank you, much appreciated. Next, we have Annette Greer. Okay, thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Okay, great. Um, I want to commend the body for the work they have done and the speakers today, but especially those who indicated not just equity, but cultural competency. One of our earlier speakers this afternoon strived uh, to say that we need a national, as many others did, a national plan, but with local input. Um, our group in North Carolina, I'm from East Carolina University, is reaching out into our community to do very similar to what you have done here. And I think um, modeling the outreach at a national level is just as important at the local level to use the data and to determine how the healthcare team uh, will work collaboratively to be effective in that distribution plan, whatever it may be, as based on an ethical framework. I like the fact that we have talked about an ethical framework and I think we need to talk more about that because there were um, noted um, persons today who everybody wants to be in pot one, level one, or level one A. And clearly, we cannot do that. I did hear uh, today when people said, you have to look at those individuals that fall into more than one risk area I think that is a consideration when we have a person who is chronically diseased but is a teacher or chronically diseased and a um, pregnant mom, uh, those people fall into a higher risk bank, if you will. The other uh, thing that I would like to mention is our pharmacy partners. Um, I was on a call last week with Moderna and Johnson & Johnson and others, and it's important to note that there's multiple vaccines that have been developed using multiple technologies. Some will be one dose, some will be two dose. And so those types of factors need to be included in the transparency 
of education so that people understand what they are getting, whether it's a one dose, whether it's a two dose, because there are a lot of myths out there that we need to overcome and single message is going to be important. Thank you very much. Next we have Carla Thomas. Hello, thank you. My name is Carla Thomas. I'm a data tracker and presenter for the Native Hawaiian and Pacific Islander COVID-19 Data Policy Lab of the UCLA Center for Health Policy Research, and I also represent the National Pacific Islander COVID-19 Response Team. Uh, Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders here and after referred to as NHPIs have been severely overlooked and ignored in this conversation surrounding vulnerable populations. NHPIs are the indigenous people of Oceania, um, ethnicities such as Samoan, Fijian, Marshallese, Chamorro, Tongan, among many, many others. NHPIs make up less than half percent of the total U.S. population at a population of around 1.5 million people. But despite this, NHPIs across the nation have the highest rates of COVID-19 cases, particularly in two thirds of states where NHPI disaggregated data is available. Some of these states where NHPIs have the highest case rates out of all racial and ethnic groups include Alaska, Arkansas, California, Colorado, Hawaii, Iowa, Illinois, Louisiana, Minnesota, Ohio, Oregon, Utah, and Washington, which is alarming for a population of this size to be affected. This disproportionate impact is a result of the fact that one out of four NHPIs are essential workers. There's a nearly 40% prevalence of comorbidities among the population. There are high rates. It's actually the highest rate of homelessness among NHPIs, which was a, a report to Congress in 2018, and we have very poor living situations where many live in high density, multi-generational housing. There are high rates of uninsured for those with health care, and we urge the committee to consider Native Hawaiians and Pacific Islanders in this equitable allocation plan because our people overlap in many of the tier one criteria groups, especially um, those with uh, comorbidities and having a large older population of about 20 percent um, where many are living in overcrowded multi-generational housing settings. Once again, I just urge this committee to consider NHPIs um, in this process because we are overlapping in many of uh, these focus groups that we are looking to provide equitable um, allocation to for the COVID-19 vaccine. Thank you. Great, thank you. And we have run over time, but I think um, it would be good to hear a few more of the comments from the public, so uh, from the general public. So we'll uh, take the last few that are in line. Uh, next, we have Barbara Merrill. Oh, uh, hello. Can you hear me? Am I unmuted? Yes, yes you, you are. Uh, thank you so much, uh, particularly for going over the over time. Uh, my name is Barbara Merrill. I'm the chief executive officer of the American Network of Community Options and Resources. And we are the National Trade Association representing private providers of services for people with intellectual and developmental disabilities and, and autism. Uh, we have over 1,600 members across the country and represent 55 state level associations. Um, our members provide the um, entire spectrum of, of lifespan services. Um, for individuals with intellectual and developmental disabilities and their families from residential services to employment services to day services to respite uh, to schools. Um, I really um, commend the committee for this initial draft. I think it's really well done and we are very encouraged by it. Um, ANCOR, along, that is our acronym, um, along with um, the American Association for Developmental Medicine and Dentistry and NASDES, the American Association for State Directors of Developmental Disability Services, will be submitting comments um, jointly. But I'd just like to make a couple of really quick comments. Um, um, our, uh, our services providers uh, have been on the front lines of this pandemic, but um, really, uh, largely overlooked. Um, in the beginning, we had to fight incredibly hard to be recognized as even essential workers able to go to work. Um, um, and access to PPE has been incredibly difficult. Um, you know, there are, it's really quite a large population of people who receive services, predominantly Medicaid funded services. 
uh, I'm going to just cite a couple statistics from a white paper that was just um, published by AADMD. Um, 591,000 people with intellectual disabilities live in settings of six and under. So nowhere near as big as the typical assisted living facility or nursing facility, yet, um, yet providers and the individuals um, who receive these services have really disproportionately been at risk. Uh, you know, all the comments um, that were made by the panel addressing the needs of older Americans, nursing facilities, assist assisted living facilities, um, are relevant um, to our population. Uh, the A uh, AADMD paper uh, referenced some of the research that's been done, um, and some of that has been referenced in the discussion draft. So I was really pleased to see that, particularly the research uh, done by Landis um, with the uh, university, or Syracuse University, rather. Let me just give you a couple quick statistics. In Virginia, as and, uh, of- here, uh, Sorry, unfortunately, we really do have to limit these to three minutes. Um, so okay, let me, let, me just wrap up, let me just wrap up just super, time, super quickly. Yeah. We're very encouraged that phase one in, uh, appears to include our frontline workers and that phase two includes individuals living in group homes, but it needs to be far more explicit. Um, in part, um, it, it, so we look forward to submitting the comments and thank you for the time. Thank you, thank you very much. Next we have David Curry. Um, hello, thank you very much. It's been a very rich discussion and compliments to um, the group for the great work. I'm representing uh, a Center for Vaccine Ethics and Policy, part of a small foundation, and my academic appointments at NYU's uh, Division of Medical Ethics. I'd just like to make two quick observations uh, about more ethically themed matters. Um, echoing um, our colleague from Penn and others who have properly described, I think as the draft does, the very complex supply uh, authorization, licensing, and recommendation environment we face over the next few years, given the number of vaccines with varying safety and efficacy profiles and potentially differently charged political baggage, we took note of um, the limited very limited uh, references to consent, which seem to be limited to line 141 and 1351 in the section uh, where you're going through the experience of frameworks. And we are concerned that consent may emerge as a very charged issue that could not only simply affect allocation volumes and mechanics, um, but could affect trust in the allocation scheme itself. The other point, which is similar, is the treatment in lines 2389 and beyond in the social, economic, and legal context of mandates. And the first area of treatment is a discussion of the historical use of mandates for children in schools for appropriate vaccines for their ages. Um, and the second is the potential for mandates that might be employed by uh, employers as a condition of employment. But in both cases, it seems like the draft is discussing the possible dislocation to the allocation framework mechanics rather than whether mandates, given the politically charged landscape we will undoubtedly continue to move through, um, might make mandates a, uh, a very challenging area, also impacting trust. It is possible that you may be intending to address these kinds of issues in chapters that are not provided in the draft. We hope so, uh, but we are mindful uh, of uh, what we are waking to each day and the fundamental impacts that consent and ideas about mandates, wherever they may come from, uh, and how they may affect not just the allocation scheme from a mechanical point of view, but from a more fundamental trust view in the whole scheme. Thank you very much. I think we have time for one last comment. 
All right, last we have Mary Jo Panettiere. Good afternoon. I'm um, participating just as a member of the public, although I uh, had a career in as a public health nurse years ago. But I, my comment is um, regarding people who are perhaps caregivers in their homes uh, of family or, or even friends. And I uh, was hoping that they would be considered in maybe one of the you know, early tiers when they are caregivers of persons with significant uh, underlying conditions or caregivers of elderly persons with, with conditions. Um, as an example, I myself uh, care for two persons in their 80s. I live with them and um, they both have underlying conditions, although I myself am much younger and, and don't have any of those uh, risk factors. I noticed in line 444 that this uh, concept that I'm speaking of was uh, included in the Johns Hopkins framework uh, where they said uh, those at greatest risk of severe illness and death and their caregivers should be considered in one of the early tiers. And um, my thinking on this is just, you know, the frequent close contact of caregivers with the vulnerable for whom they care. And also the fact that, uh, you know, they, the caregivers uh, are doing an important societal function, taking care of people in their homes, even though the caregivers are not, uh, you know, employed by a healthcare agency or home care agency, but they're, they're doing similar function and uh, in so doing, um, you know, are perhaps relieving some of the burden on the healthcare system, uh, you know, by taking on the role of a caregiver. So I wanted to just say that I thought that they should be included, perhaps, a, you know, the similar time is when the vulnerable people are eligible for vaccination, that it would be them and their caregivers. All right, thank you very much for your time. Great, thank you. And, um, you know, I don't know about anybody else, but I could continue going on and listening to this very rich commentary. Um, but, uh, you know, we want to respect everybody's time. So first of all, just thanks to everybody who showed up to provide your insights, your wisdom, your passion, your personal experiences, um, the data that you provided, it all makes such a difference. And I think this really has been a very, very rich discussion. You know, I think it, it really demonstrated why it was worthwhile to do this. Um, you know, we have a lot of work to, to continue to do. You've given us a lot of great things to think about, some um, specific to uh, the draft that we release, some that may be more relevant to some of the chapters that we have yet to go, and some that are frankly beyond the mandate of this particular report but nonetheless are very important um, comments to be reflected. Uh, so, you know, there's no way that I'm gonna to try to summarize what were the key points and the important issues because there were so many. Um, I'd like to thank our, our committee for hanging in there and listening. You know, as I looked at this um, Brady Bunch of squares, you know, I saw all the nods and, you know, really um, people really leaning into this and, and, and listening very attentively to issues. So I think the committee has really taken this um, uh, seriously and, and we will be going back together as a committee and deliberating about all of these issues. Uh, again, wanna thank the incredible staff for all that they did to make this meeting possible, as well as you know, continuing to um, move us along um, on, on our uh, journey as we continue to make sure that we keep this make this a report that is, is really of high quality um, and of value to the nation so I, I think i will just stop there and say again thanks to everybody for um, this incredibly rich afternoon you've given us a lot to think about uh, but uh, we really really thank you and this has been incredibly worthwhile so um, thank you all and um, we will see you soon and oh just to uh, for to remind people, yes, <laughs> thank you, that you can continue to provide written comments until um, 11.59 Eastern time on Friday, this Friday, September 4th. Many of you had many more comments than you were able to present orally. And I know there are others who have comments that they weren't able to um, express to us, provide to us. So thank you. Um, we look forward to your written reports and we really appreciate this day. 
So thank you very much.